I very soon here. We are live now. Hello and welcome everyone. We are at the first session of Methodologies of Artistic Practice Now. Uh, this seminar is moderated and conducted by myself and Patrick Shabbos. The seminar will focus on the intersections between artistic practice and new technologies and how these can reshape contemporary artistic production. While the seminar will concentrate on each artist's specific methodologies and career track, its overarching topic is how contemporary artistic practice can breach the normative notions of production and critique and transcend them. That's sort of like the general frame of the seminar. Now, to really, to really get into the bulk of what we will be talking about, we really have to define what is contemporary art. And if we want to talk about contemporary art, we definitely have to go a little bit back and discuss what is what was before contemporary art, because often artistic paradigms or literary paradigms reject or oppose certain elements of the paradigm that comes before them in order to establish their identity and basically define why, why a new name or new category is required. So basically, without addressing what is modern art and was there anything between modern and contemporary, was there any other category between modern and contemporary, we can't really discuss contemporary, right? So for, for kind of like a, I think Miguel just joined us. For, hello, for, hello. Hello, yes, Miguel, yes, I'm going to mute you because you're coming in a little bit late and I'm going to mute you to not uh, interrupt the flow. Sorry about that. Welcome. Uh, so for a very brief and quick description of modern art, which is inseparable from the notion of avant-garde, the best place to go would be Greenberg's avant-garde and kitsch essay. It's available online and as an extra readings we will add that to the google classroom for those of you who want to delve deeper into it so greenberg uh basically defines modern art which basically you can put a date to it some people say 1860s 1850s 1870s but definitely 1890s by 1890s modern art actually knew that it's called more that it, the category is called modern art right which is basically by the emergence of people like picasso and matisse so for, for Greenberg, modern art, I'm, I'm quoting Greenberg, modern art as a cultural resort of bourgeois society and accept, is an exception to mass culture, is a part of Western bourgeoisie society, has produced something unheard of therefore, avant-garde culture. So for him, avant-garde arises from the bourgeois, bourgeois society. A superior consciousness of history more precisely, the appearance of a new kind of criticism of society, a historical criticism made this possible. So basically, avant-garde is a result of French and in a way Russian revolution for him. So this type of critique of society allows for artists to also do their own job of dare to criticize a society or like be, be critical of not maybe just society as we learn when we read avant-garde and kitsch, but criticize art making or criticize the field of art itself. This criticism has not been confronted our present society with timeless utopias, but has soberly examined it in terms of history and of cause and effect of what came before it. Justification and function of the forms that lie at the heart of every society. Nevertheless, without the circulation of revolutionary ideas in the air, they would have never been able to, artists would have never been able to isolate their concept of the bourgeoisie in order to define what they were not. So basically it's about the emergence of Bohemia out of the bourgeois, right? 
nor without the moral aid of revolutionary political attitudes would they have had the courage to assert themselves as aggressively as they did against the prevailing standards of society. Courage indeed was needed for this because the avant-garde emigration from bourgeoisie society to Bohemia meant also an emigration from the markets of capitalism upon which artists and writers had been thrown by the falling away of aristocratic patronage. So already we have a lot here to sort of like understand what is modern art, right? So you have the disgruntled kids of the bourgeoisie that are basically as a result of the courage and the kind of tools provided to them by revolution in a larger society are able to look at the culture and the way culture is produced and kind of begin to separate themselves and say, I don't want to be that and kind of start to develop what they can be in opposed to this thing. And also, but they're also facing the fact that, uh, with the, with the fall of aristocracy, the patronage of art has gone into a crisis because if, if in the past the aristoc aristocrats funded art and art production, now there's this question of, okay, who's going to fund this production, right, for, for, for the, for the avant-garde artist, for the modern artist? To find the path along which it would be possible to keep culture molting in the midst of ideological confusion and violence. So this is sort of like what he... He defined as the as the as the objective of the modern modernist modernist artist is to find a path along which it will be possible to keep culture moving in the midst of ideological confusion and violence. So this is a way of kind of like creating room for art for art's sake, but also an art for art's sake that it's art for art's sake ness came out of a political decision that the artist made of not wanting to fully address issues of the society. So the fact that artists, modernist artists, decides to address only art and the field itself is, in the, is a political decision to begin with. But it's a political decision to keep art apolitical, basically. That's how, that's how, um, that's how Greenberg sees it, right? And this is how he goes on. The avant-garde specialization of itself, the fact that its best artists are artists' artists, and its best poets, 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 and its best writers, the writers, writers, has estranged a great many of those who were capable of formerly enjoying and appreciating ambitious art and literature, but who are not unwilling or unable to acquire an initiation into their craft's secret, right? So basically this political decision by the modernists to remove themselves from addressing the society makes the audience of art even smaller because even those who are kind of interested in art, who kind of could understood and relate to it, now are all of a sudden are dealing with people who are whose works are so esoteric, so specialized, that basically they're either unable or unwilling to engage with it, right? So in a way, rather than finding new patronage, the, the modern artist is actually shrinking its audience, right? So what's going to happen next? The masses have always remained more or less indifferent to culture in the process of cultural development. But today, such culture is being abandoned by those to whom it actually belonged, our ruling class. So ruling class in general is kind of like, basically, as it explained earlier, are, are basically getting alienated out of this, 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 this way of art making and, and basically shaking their head and saying, like, I don't understand abstraction, for instance. For it is the latter that the avant-garde belongs. But actually, for Greenberg, modern artists belongs to this class. So no culture can develop without a social basis, without a source of stable income. And in the case of the avant-garde, this is a very key, key point here that we're going to like hold on to, basically, hopefully till the end of the seminar. And, and a proposition that me and, me and Patrick have here about this. Uh, no culture can develop without a social basis, without a source of stable income. And in the case of the avant-garde, this was provided by an elite among the ruling class of that society from which it assumed itself to be cut off, but to which it has always remained attached by an umbilical cord of gold. So it's a very packed metaphor here, right? So basically for Greenberg, this 
paradox or this paradoxical relationship with bourgeoisie is that art is, has separated itself from the society that is ruled by the bourgeoisie, but has kind of like gone back into a sort of state of uh, an unborn child in the belly of the bourgeoisie, right? Right inside, protected in the belly, connected with an umbilical cord of gold. So it's getting fed by bourgeoisie, but not out in the open in a society because masses, but also the ruling class and even the middle class who used to like art, which are finding it more and more alienating, are not interested. And actually artists themselves are not interested in this society, right? So where is the best place to develop avant-garde and this move the culture forward is right in the belly of the richest section of the society who will keep funding the production of the avant-garde. So this way, Greenberg does basically wonders, he does magic because he basically not only describes the system, but actually writes an algorithm almost as to how modern art can see itself, how modern art should see itself, and how modern art should finance itself. Basically, this is written in the 1930s prior to the World War II. This is before the American art market is, is formed. This is before Rockefellers enter the, 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 the field of buying art and supporting artists and setting up MoMA, right? This is written before actually MoMA was even open or around the same time that MoMA opened, right? There's no Museum of Modern Art yet when this text is written or it's very early actually because MoMA opened in the, on the eve of, uh, on the, eve of the, the financial meltdown or the, whatever it's called, the 1930s. But, and I think this essay, I'm not sure, was it written in 1929 or 1932, somewhere, somewhere, somewhere along the line. So yeah, so he, he, he basically signals to the artist that you can be both cool, critical, and, and sustain yourself through this new system of patronage, right? So really, this is modern art, and this is what contemporary art tries to not be, or tries to break from, and critique, both in symbolically but also in the way art is framed and art is made and art is talked about now what we then have is let's just fast forward to contemporary art right but we we're we're going to go back a half a step because it's impossible not to do that and it's very important to do that because it makes a very important contribution to what we're proposing here in the seminar right so Peter Osborne, a uh, British uh, art theorist and writer who has written extensively about contemporary art, talk about contemporary art as what he calls a post-conceptual condition arising from three recent events in visual arts. The broad, number one, the broad acceptance of the idea that any materials and not just traditional ones used in drawing, painting, and sculpture can be put to use in a work of art. So that is uh, basically, it's basically liberation of the medium, right? Because modern art was, despite its claims to be not different than the, than the art of the past, was still very much limited to drawing, sculpture, and painting, right? So what, what you get with contemporary art is like basically uh, a liberation of medium. You can take anything and call it art. You can make installation out of anything, and it's art. And it doesn't have to be painting, doesn't have to be sculpture, doesn't have to be drawing, right? And the second point, the, the more important point, is conceptual, uh, contemporary art's broad acceptance of conceptualism, right? As the most important fundamental sort of like engine of art. And what is conceptualism is a, uh, theory of art claiming that the work of art is the contingent embodiment of an idea or a concept, right? Is a materialization of the concept. And what's important here is just as important as paint, uh, sculpture, or installation is actually ideas that are embodied in, in, the, in, this, in this work, right? And then, and the third one, being how these two are sort of like synthesized together. How, the, how this democracy of medium is then applied to the 
supremacy of idea and how these two come together to basically form what we know as contemporary art. Now, when there's a little bit of extra note here to be made, and that is when we talk about contemporary art, of course, contemporary, we all know what it means. It means art of today, right? But contemporary art is actually like, is a capital C because it doesn't really signal the art of today because the homeless person at the corner who also makes a drawing to sell it for $5 is his work is contemporary, but he's not contemporary art. Why? Because contemporary art is almost like a genre of art that we just try to describe using the words of Osborne, right? So it's very important to not conflate the word contemporary here with just anything made today because if I make a forgery of a Van Dyke painting, it is a, it's, it's made today, but it's actually try to pretend to belong to the past. Or if I just make a realistic painting of a, of a, of a still life, it's not contemporary art because still life was popular in like a certain period of time. And me doing it today, just totally make it not contemporary, right? So just wanted to make that point clear that contemporary art doesn't mean everything that's made today but it has something to do, it, it still has to be made today, but it's art made today that basically uh, is framed by this question that, that um, Peter Osborne kind of like puts in the beginning, right? Of like importance of idea. And then basically what happens is with contemporary art, uh, the baby, uh, the Greenborg baby is supposed to be born, right? And, and supposed to be out of the belly now because the art basically by embracing ideas is, is basically a stepping away from, from pure abstraction, uh, a stepping away from not willing to deal with society and deal with things and wants to come out and actually be in the society again to the point that it actually ties itself to the political, social, cultural events of the moment, the contemporaneity, right? So basically it's, but, but as we can see, or as I would like to say, uh, this baby is not born it's just it, my metaphor for it is that the baby is now in an incubator and the incubator is still connected to the bourgeoisie through an um, a, a technological umbilical cord and it's still gold but the but the cord is visible now and the baby is visible and it's all out in the open and the, and the baby can see the world too but it's still not fully out because it's still the anthropology of art that Greenberg set, and this is sort of like the, the contention that we make, this anthropology has been active, not just for the period of modern art, but for the contemporary art. Because contemporary art's political economy is still being financed by the very same people that Greenberg conceived of them to be financing modern art. So even though the, the rationale and the ideas behind contemporary art are different than modern art, his political economy is almost, in a way, not not fully, but almost identical. And and we can we can discuss this a little bit later. But what's interesting here is that is that if you if you go back to Osborne's Osborne's definition, we are dealing with the word uh, we are dealing with the word conceptualism, right? So in a way, we have to go back and actually ask: So what is conceptual art? That then contemporary art tries to resolve it with a question of medium, right? So to understand conceptual art, you don't need to like dig into deep, deep books. The easiest place is go to Wikipedia and read the definition. It's pretty good. And I have it here for you. Conceptual art, sometimes simply called conceptualism, is art in which the concept or ideas involved in the work take precedent over traditional aesthetic technical and material concerns. Some works of conceptual art, sometimes called installations, may be constructed by anyone simply by following a set of written instructions. This method was fundamental to American artist Saul Levitt definition of conceptual art, one of the first to appear in print. Very, very important. And like basically the core of one of the other propositions of this seminar, but you can find it in the first screen of Wikipedia, right? So, so Saul Levitt says, conceptual art, uh, let's just read it. Where do we have the Saul Levitt's? I have the Saul Levitt's, okay, just one sec. I might have to go back to actually uh, Wikipedia and read Saul Levitt's definition. 
Uh, here we go. He says, in conceptual art, the idea or concept is the most important aspect of the work. When an artist uses a conceptual form of art, it means that all of the planning and decisions are made beforehand and the execution is perfunctory, is a perfunctory effect, affair. The idea becomes a machine that makes the art. Oh, the word machine, right? Art after the machines, right? So you see, for, for, for conceptual art that actually comes prior to quote unquote contemporary art, art is already algorithmic, art is already machine made. Why? Because as Saul Levitt describes it, con conceptual art can be a set of instructions like a pro computer program written on a paper and anyone can pick it up and basically go get the material and make it, right? So, so in fact, if we, if we try to resolve this with uh, what Peter Osborne talks about, what we end up with is that conceptual, uh, uh, contemporary art might actually be a two step forward from, from modernism, but actually one step back from conceptual art, because what it, what it really says, what, it, what contemporary art really says is that, wait a minute, that's just too crazy. We still need to be in charge. Artist is a very unique, unique being, and materials are very important. And if we give all that away as a set of instructions and anyone can make it, then, then basically we're out of job. So in a way, it's, it's, a, it's a bit reactionary. And then it tries to basically, by bringing the idea that mediums are now open and you can use anything you want, so like, repurpose a function for the artist here, which is then the artist's job is to basically produce the concept, but don't give it away to everyone, but actually be the executioner who will then materialize or, or embodies the, the concept in a basically medium, be it like whatever it is, right? So, but, but there, there, there's a little bit more to it. And the more to itness is that the sort of like philosophical consequences and epistemological consequences of this shift from modern to conceptual and from conceptual to contemporary art, which I think the best person who has basically pinned it down and talked about it is our former board member and one of the people who were key in the, in the conceptualization of the new center, uh, Dr. Sohail Malik of the Goldsmith University. And Sohail, in a very influential essay that was written originally for the Spike Art Quarterly, published in Berlin back in 2013, called Why We Should Destroy Contemporary Art. That's literally what the piece is called. Uh, kind of defines the philosophical operations of contemporary art and basically rejects it. And interestingly enough, basically takes issues with art historians misreading of Saul Levitt uh, and basically how this misreading of Saul Levitt caused critics to kind of embrace contemporary art as a step forward. Whereas if you had not, if they had not misread Saul Levitt, they would have really seen contemporary art for what it was, which was a reactionary movement against modernism in a way and not forward into something better than modernism. Definitely a reactionary move compared to conceptual art, but also, but also against modernism. So now let's, let's engage a little bit with Sohail. He says, what does an artwork means for you? What, does, what sense do you make of contemporary art? In the paradigm of contemporary art, the answer is clear. It's up to you. Constrained by the artwork subject matter, in so far as you can determine it, its material organization and presentation, and the information you can glean from the press release, the artist interest, or what the art invokes, you respond to this configuration of mild injunctions. Mild because the pre parameters are open enough, loose enough, opaque enough for you to have to make your own way through the artwork. It asks you a question, making an open-ended assertion 
without definitive sense. You reply usually not to the artwork, but in the best case, with a shift in your own system of ideas, values, even the very way you formulate your languages afterwards. You are the center of the artwork as the viewer, or as Julian Rebentisch positively remarks, since the artwork is not just its material being, but also the sense that it makes and the values it inscribes, what is primary in contemporary art, its condition and horizon, is the art experience that is the transformation of both the subjective viewer and the artwork. And now we're gonna read Reverend Tisha's own words that says, aesthetic experience is nothing that can be had by the subject. The term experience refers to a process between subject and object that transforms both the object in so far as it is only in and through the dynamic of its experience that it is brought to life as a work of art and the subject in so far as it takes on a self-reflective form its own performativity right so here what is what is very important here is understanding the category of correlationism and co what is correlation basically because for malik Contemporary art is utterly correlationist. And now, correlationism was a term that was coined by philosopher Maisu, who was first translated to English by one of our own very instructors, Ray Brassier, who also teaches at the University of Beirut as a philosopher. This book began the kind of like philosophical movement that in a way is at the Germination of New Center. Uh, originally called speculative realism, later on branched out into many different different branches, and were sort of like indebted both to Maesu and to their to his rejection of correlationism as sort of like the impasse of post-structuralist thought at the end of the last century, and how basically with the with the help of the student of Alan Badu, how we were able to sort of like transcend the question of correlationism. So now, what is correlationism? The problem with correlationism is that all accounts of reality, according to according to like dominant dominant phil philosophies, or dominant philosophies back then, are necessarily accounts of how reality is th is thought or known, not reality itself, but how reality is thought or known. Put it the other way, reality itself cannot be known in itself, since it is always thought or apprehended by a consciousness. So basically, the limit of reality is a limit of consciousness. So you can only know what you can only know. You cannot know or think about things that are beyond the ability of your consciousness. That's really the core problem of core problem of correlationism, right? And so for Sohail, contemporary art is the embodiment of this correlationism. Why? Because it basically it 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 waits for the viewer to come and define it and for the viewer to come and basically experience it to actually become art. To be clear, contemporary art as the aesthetic experience of sense and value making as a constitution of the art object and subject assumes correlationism and reproduces it, affirms it in every moment of its open-ended experience. The artworks and its discursive formulation of contemporary art object, events, performances, images, press releases, reviews, magazine essays, auction catalogs, stylize and configure a correlationism in how art is to be taken by its audience. Contemporary art appeals to its addresses to determine the art in their own terms, including the disagreement between viewers that is the best ideal democratic result of contemporary art. Artists have an interest in this or in that, the artwork exhibition explores or plays with or interrogates or shows sensitivity about such and such topic. No more definitive or precise an account can be permitted at the cost of reducing viewers' own capacities to make their call on the art. Right? So this is really where we come to sort of like the, the, the end of the answer to the question that I raised, what is contemporary art? and what were the problems of the contemporary art and how it relates to these epochs prior to it which in the larger sense is modern art with the exception of that very brief period of american and british conceptual artists 
who kind of like did something different and then how contemporary art kind of like folded it and synthesized the two and came up with this new strategy of art making which basically dominated the dominated the world of art since late late 70s until now with with of course exceptions of of other other forms of art trying to come into being but never really fully sort of like becoming the dominant mode of art production and display contemporary art is what we inherited from the 20th century and what we have now now i'm going to just talk about uh what to me were the reasons for writing the art after the machines and how I try to very well aware of both Osborne and Malik's critiques and definitions, how I try to basically uh, enrich that critique and expand it by adding things that were related to, to technology, just to simplify it and rather than coming up with like $5 words. So my contribution in that essay, if I wanna like summarize it is trying to identify the problem of the human, right? And, and actually this is really shows how Saul Levitt was, and his definition of conceptual art is really at the heart of what I perceive to be like a, like a type of art that is at least tries to stop being so, real, so dependent on human, right? So to me, contemporary art, which also inherits from, from prior paradigms, maybe with the exception of conceptual art, art a little bit, is human oriented. It's art by human, about humans, for humans. This, this type of art makes the machine in the human, it hides it because it creates an authentic image of human, right? And the experience of art by the viewer and this, this experience of art, which we just heard how Sohail Malik describes the contemporary art version of it, this experience of art and finishing the artwork by experiencing it, sensing it, and putting meaning to it by every subject is more than that. Because what it does is it actually, it affirms that the hum, human as a subject actually exists. A real unique subject as, capable of seeing art and coming up with this definition and coming up with this understanding actually real and is possible. So, so in a way, experiencing art becomes a proof on the existence of a, of a unique category of the human away from both nature and the machine, right? So to me, that is another problem of art in general, but particularly contemporary art because of its, its dependence on correlationism, right? That basically, it creates the authentic image of human and its experience becomes the affirmation of the humanity of the subject totally against these new technological abstractions that have emerged since sort of like name it at least since 1970s and the, and the, and the introduction of microprocessors and then the later this and that and the internet and artificial intelligence and blah 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 you can we can go on right in light of all these new abstracted technologies it's sort of like defines what human is almost human you know what i mean if you want to put it human is the uh, human is the being that can understand art that becomes sort of like almost like the last vestige of what a human can be is this ability to make and understand and appreciate art right so it becomes like the last holdout of human against against like ideas that try to say no you're not unique you're you're part nature and part machine and the ontology of human has to be rewritten art kind of resists that through its, its production and through its sort of like propagation of this myth that the human exists. That really is what I try to explain in that, in the, in that text, right? That's what really the, the spirit of the text I asked you, you guys to read is about. And in a way you saw that reflected in a question that Manuel asked in the film, Art Offline. Now, another thing that, that, that the art does this, this art, particularly our, our, the art of our time, contemporary art does, is that by making this claim, it kind of also negates and ignores the fact that not only we, 
we've already been part nature, part machine from the very beginning. Not only uh, nature itself can be conceived as a self, self-made, self-regulating, self-improving, complex living machine or organism, but that it it denies us the ability to use our knowledge of systems to project it back and try to even understand ourselves better in terms of machine. So by insisting on humanity of the human, it kind of denies us the epistemic horizon that uh, computationalism and the, the rise of the machine has opened us to us to better understand ourselves and our place in the universe. So really it's basically art has become Contemporary art is fully counter epistemic in in insisting on the uniqueness of the human human and the uniqueness of the art object. That's really what was my intention from writing the the essay in 2015. Now we 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 have a lot of material for you because we're only been 42 minutes into the class. But what I really wanted to like begin telling you is that as part of the assignment for this for the seminar and as part of the collective or collaborative project that we will be doing it is important that you hold on to terms that you find interesting and at the end of the class we will talk about how these can be utilized and used but any any terminology up to two per seminar up to two per lecture i think each each, each one of you participants should try to hold on at least to two terms that you're interested in understanding more or actually getting involved in redefining it yourself. So yeah, so if you're making notes, make sure you by the end of today, you have at least two terms that you are interested in further investigating, but also further defining. So yeah, so that, that, that food note, because I don't, want, I don't want the seminar to go at the end and then you realize you should have made notes about some of the terminology that you find interesting. So I just wanted to say that, but we're gonna go over what we're gonna do with these a little bit later, closer to the end of the seminar. Now, what I like to do is basically maybe there's two things to get done. One is I think Patrick would want, Patrick wants to introduce our choices of artists and I will be here to sort of like after each introduction to, to say why these artists are actually crucial for the kind of program or for the kind of ideas that, that I've put forth and we're going to continue discussing and how they can actually, their, their, their inclusion in a seminar can help us have a much better and much richer sort of this collaborative art project that hopefully we'll be all working towards its completion by the end of the seminar. You want to start? Yes. So I'll, I'll start from uh, chronologically. Julieta Aranda. Central to Aranda's multidimensional practice, her, her involvement with circulation mechanisms, her interest in science fiction, space travel, zones of friction, and her interest in the possibilities for a production of political subjectivities weigh all of the above. Since 2008, Julieta Aranda has been the editor of EFLUX journal together with Anton Vidocle and Brian Quanwood. So yeah, so I really thought Julieta would be a great introduction because A, EFLUX has been at a forefront of not only communicating what exhibitions are coming up, but through the journal basically putting forth what is contemporary art and uh, how it is defined and who should we read and, and what set of ideas outside of the art relate to some of the art that people are making and how the relevance of these ideas actually make these artists more important than market artists that were being sort of like promoted through more traditional forms of communication which you can basically name as like Art Forum magazine or like maybe even October magazine which are sort of like predate uh, efflux, right? So I, I thought Julieta would be a great choice to have because A, she has been involved from the issue one as an editor with efflux, and B, her own art making sort of like already has gone beyond correlationism and her engagement with science fiction, her engagement with, uh, with uh, basically ideas of space travel and, and it's really, really 
where where things are at for for, for me. But also, it's an art that is that is not as Suhail called them indeterminate. Her work is not wait to is wa waiting to be finished by the audience. It actually has an orientation and has a trajectory that that the audience are supposed to use in order to engage and understand the work. So in a way, uh, her work is already post Suhail Malek critique. The next artist in the list is Ahmed Ogut. He is a social cultural initiator, artist and lecturer who lives and works in Berlin and Amsterdam. He is the initiator of the initiator of the Saarland University, which is an autonomous knowledge exchange platform by refugees and the asylum seekers. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much interested in Ahmed's, Ahmed's career because he has really tried to still like put an axe to that incubator and really do the final step, which is like getting the baby out of the incubator and say, okay, it's time for you to actually do something, get out and do something. But the beauty of it is that while he does that, he actually is also involved in uh, making really beautiful new forms. Uh, his sculptures, his installations, sort of like have this ability to, to, to be both appreciated by general public, but also have really like meaningful relationship to history of politics, global politics, history of art. That's very, very interesting and balanced type of practice. But also, he's a very generous instructor, as you can see. By attending his seminar, you would learn a lot about the anthropology of contemporary art, basically how artists survive and work and produce work and get shows and go around the world to try to talk about their ideas and exhibit their work. One of the most brilliant instructors for this and make sure you won't miss it because you will learn a lot and you actually get a chance to ask questions from him, which will then resolve some of your own personal uh, uncertainties about what is going on in the art world. John Gerard is best known for his sculptures and installations, which typically make take the form of digital simulations displayed using real-time computer graphics. Gerard's words concern themselves with the nature of contemporary power by exemplifying the mass structures and vast networks of energy which materialized during the 20th century. Is that Manuel? Could be, but I'm going to. Uh, it's Lauren. I'm going to mute Lauren and continue on. Yeah, so John is one of my favorite artists ever. He, uh, his his work is like one of one of one of the, his practice is one of the one of the closest closest one to sort of like my ideal work, which is sort of work made heavily with machines. Most of the time, it's about the machinic subject. And of course, it's viewed by humans still, but his work is the kind of work that easily can, I, can, I can see it being understood and appreciated by, our, by the robots and algorithms of the future. While at the same time, relying heavily on, on the capabilities that they offer. Just to, just to summarize it, uh, John makes 365 day videos. Most of his work are like as long as a full year, but they're simulations of a particular location on earth that has some kind of like crazy technological infrastructure set up in them. And then he basically creates his environment in 3D and subjected to the meteorological information that he that he downloads from the internet about that particular location on earth so days sun rises and goes down for 30, 365 days according to like spring and summer and fall and winter so you can uh, a viewer who has the control can actually fast forward and look at that location from a part at a particular time during during the year or he usually sets them up like a clock at the gallery or at the collector's home or wherever they're displayed and they run based on the time zone of that location and they just run almost like a visual clock. And often when you confront them, 
regardless of the size, because there's sometimes just the size of a computer monitor, but there's sometimes like an 18 foot wall. You really think they're realistic videos, but it's only when you get really close to the screen that you realize that they're made up of made up of pixels and uh, they're not video. And he has a studio full of computer programmers and full of uh, render people who basically translate his photographs and his drawings and notes into sort of like this 3D simulated worlds. So the next artist is Agnieszka Polska. She uses computer generated media to reflect on an individual and their social responsibility. She renders the ethical ambiguity of our time into hallucinatory films and installations. Yeah, like my my interest uh, my interest in her work has to do with how uh, by concentrating on the on the sort of surreal side of human existence in relation to the machine, kind of like points to points to a future in which we need to think about this type of effects being produced in the machines themselves. Often, often her installations uh, makes you think that you're really in front of sentient machines. They're all used video, but the way she uses multiple screens and how the images on these screens relate to each other really makes you feel like you're in a living environment, a living environment that has inherited some of the psychological issues and problems of the human and it's uh, making a feedback loop back to the audience through just projection. Renzo Martins studied political science and art. Together with the plantation workers of Cercle d'Art, the Travailleurs de Plantation Congolaise, he uses artistic critique to redress economic inequality, not symbolically, put in material terms. Consequently, they opened an OMA designed white cube on a former Unilever plantation in 2017, where they currently develop an inclusive worker or owned an ecologically post plantation. Yeah, so another one of those artists who is actually sort of like kicking the art in the butt and saying like, you gotta go out there and do something. Renzo basically is, is interested in how the, the mechanisms of cultural colonialism can be, can be sort of like used for a reverse effect. That's the best way to sort of like summarize what he does, right? And literally kind of like rather than bringing works from discovering artists in, the, in, in this global south and bringing their work to the white cube in the west, he's basically exporting the white cube alone itself back to the global south and then using it to create small scale political economies that are run and run and they they promote and basically finance artistic production at the local level not only that but put them in conversation with what we consider high art in the in the western white supremacist world right so in a way it's like rather than deconstructing he's kind of repurposing the whole art world system in order to do something something in reverse with with cultural colonialism marva arsenios is an artist filmmaker and researcher who reconsiders the politics of the mid 20th century from a contemporary perspective with a particular focus on gender relations urbanism and industrialization she approaches research collaboratively and seeks to work across disciplines. Yeah, li like, like our own Manuel Correa, which we will be, we will be speaking with very soon, uh, Marwa's medium is film. And in a way you can say uh, documentary filmmaking, but she's also in the process of repurposing the medium of, of, of documentary filmmaking by introducing elements from fiction narrative and her work really engages deeply with the cultural and political sort of like leftover issues from 20th century that still lingers around the middle east mostly mostly near her home country of lebanon 
but also in play in 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 trouble places like Syria and in the Kurdish autonomous zone of Syria and also since she's doing a PhD practice in Vienna and teaching at the same time she's a very great practitioner to tell us about sort of like the latest development in art pedagogy and how sort of like PhD programs and master programs are dealing with uh, with artistic production these days Navina G. Khan Dossos has developed a form of geometric abstraction that merges traditional anachronism of Islamic art with the algorithmic nature of the interconnected world we live in. The subject of her work is often the conflicted and complex relationship of Islam to the West, which is an inescapable and vital subject to be dealing with today. Yeah, so my connection to uh, Naveen comes from the fact that we both admirers of Laura Marx, and I'm sure she will be asking you maybe to read some Laura Marx. Laura Marx is a Vancouver-based scholar of Islamic philosophy and, and uh, new media. So her research is partially on sort of like algorithms and artificial intelligence and computer-generated work, but also how this new artwork relates to both philosophies and aesthetics of geometric Islamic art from the medieval time forward. So she kind of bridges a gap between two really seemingly unrelated world. That's Laura. But then it's interesting because Naveen is an artist who has taken this on as an artistic practice. And she sort of like tries to do what Laura does in theory in art, but with 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 added with the added value or added fact that we are in the midst of or have been in the last 10 years in the midst of dealing with a with the rise of isis fighting quote unquote terrorism and all that so that 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 dimension of contemporary life adds more layers of significance and importance to naveen's work i actually wrote an essay for an essay i wrote a short fiction for one of naveen's catalogs two years ago which is a which is a, fic, a, a a story about the graphic designer who designed the ISIS sort of like promotional magazine first in Syria and then later in Istanbul. That sort of like was published along the, along her beautiful abstractions. And I don't know if you get a chance. Maybe she adds that also to the reading list. But yeah, another 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 reason why I I think it's important for her to to be to be part of the discussion is that again she both deals with with the questions of technology and its 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 role in art making but also with this geopolitical issue of how the West and Islam are confronting each other. That was the last of the instructions. Oh yeah, okay, so, yeah, so, so th this will be the, the, the course of the, the, the next seven weeks. We'll give you some time while we go through the rest of the seminar, which uh, will like be a discussion with, with Manuel and a little bit more of, more of, uh, basically, Patrick has to talk about the reading that we had. But I think since Manuel is here and we're right on time with him, maybe we can begin the begin the, the session with Manuel, and that way we will basically be on time. Manuel, are you are you? Um, can you please unmute yourself? On the top of the screen. There's a microphone button that you have to unmute. There we go. Okay, great. So, should I read your bio, or you 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 you're okay just talking about the fact that where you come from, you're involved with the new center, you're you you're one of our early certificate students, right? And what do you do today? It would be good if you give a little brief bio of yourself. Uh, yes, uh, I guess I'm a filmmaker and artist. Uh, I started really uh, doing photography, but through my research, I wound up uh, more invested in, in making films, especially I got involved in documentary films. My first film that uh, I think you saw for the class, it's Art of Line, uh, that features uh, a lot of intellectuals, artists, even philosophers, uh, discussing uh, in 2014 uh, what seemed to be the challenges that 
or or the changes in perception that uh, digitality was offering art. So no, so the documentary doesn't tackle so much production because I thought that, of course, the way that the digital affects the artistic production is it's it's quite evident. The artists will use whatever tools are available to make work. Uh, but I was more interested in the way that. Uh, digital technology changes the way we learn about art, the way curation functions, and the way we distribute art. Uh, so, of course, this is where the film comes from. Uh, the film was screened in 2015 uh, in the Rotterdam Film Festival, and it has screened in a lot of places, uh, mostly in public programs and museums, galleries, uh, in television in Denmark. Uh, and you can buy it. You can buy the DVDs, and you know, they're, it's pretty valuable. It's also online. <laughs> So, so tell us about what are you doing these days? How did the how did how did how, your your life after after Emily Carr and New Center and w what are you doing these days? Yeah, so I started thinking of different ways that I could uh, generate a political engagement uh, that was I felt impossible to, to do in a white cube or in an, or in true art circuits, and I figured that the way that I could do it is by trying to reverse engineer uh, participatory ethnography uh, to generate different kind of uh, connections or interactions with people that could be productive. So for instance, some of the things that I did is that I worked in Colombia uh, with a collective of 190 mothers who are looking for the disappeared. Uh, in Colombia, we had a very long civil conflict that lasted more than 50 years. Or, or that it's, and, and I would say it's ongoing, but this is a whole other discussion. I would just say that the conflict modernized as part of a peace agreement, so it, it became a modern conflict instead of, you know, uh, being what it used to be. Uh, so I tried to create this participatory ethnography in which we would create a theater play with this, with this woman. Uh, and this theater play uh, allowed us to call jails and, you know, tell jails, okay, we're a theater collective, we want to bring uh, this woman into the, into the jail so that they can present the, the play to the inmates. Uh, of course, the idea was different. They don't let, uh, you know, civil collectives or basically anybody into the jails for corruption reasons that have happened before. Uh, the idea was to confront them and to try to find uh, where the mass graves were, where they disappeared, where the bodies were. Uh, this started and I did the pilot for this and we wrote play, we catched them. Uh, but this is a project that has been ongoing and it has yielded, I think, significant results. They found 160 mass graves, which is 160 mass graves that the government wasn't able to, to give them. Um, and that is, of course, very significant. That, that means that, you know, not, not all of them by any means, but 10 women found their children that were disappeared. So, I mean, the discussion that we had in Berlin is that, yes, a, a, the there, was a, there, was a, there is a reluctance to understand that art can do politics. Uh, there is, I mean... A lot, of, a lot of the most interesting political theory or critical law scholarship that's coming up right now with people like Alan Feldman or, you know, other critical law scholars, they are using visual culture, visual theory uh, to find new ways of engagement and new ways of understanding what is going on um, in the world. I mean, in the case of forced disappearance, it's, it's pretty clear because we're talking about visibility. And I think there's no better way to talk about visibility and the, the detectability, uh, perceptibility, than starting from a, from a visual arts or visual culture uh, theory background. So, so maybe think, maybe maybe speak about the, the forensic architecture. Yeah, absolutely. So I so after I did this project and I did that, I, I decided to get involved uh, as a student in the forensic architecture program in Gosford University. So I moved to London, where I'm right now. Um, I'm studying and I'm doing my projects uh, through them. Uh, forensic architecture is basically an architecture firm. That, I mean, it's totally, it's multidisciplinary. Uh, so there's architects, there's artists, there's forensics, there's, you know, if, if the project needs, there's an odontologist. I mean, like like the same way forensics works. If you go to a, to a mass grave or to like an actual forensic site, I mean, it's multidisciplinary. There could be photographers, there could be documentary. It could be, I mean, and, and their, their function, their, their, it's very important that we understand that there's no, there's no separation between this. Um, and the way, for, the way forensic or, or like the word forensic comes from is, uh, is somebody that is, that is an expert or that witnessed something or that has a, a, a material or immaterial testimony. And this person goes to the forum, in this case, it would be the Roman forum and presents it. Um, 
you know, basically shedding light on it. It's a, I mean, it's it's that that's basically what it is really. So what forensic architecture is doing is that they're trying to produce evidence of human rights violations and basically climate climate atrocities or violence against the environment in many different places. So and they're and they're using aesthetics. They're using art uh, to create what they call an evidentiary aesthetics. So so I think that's that's. I guess that's a that's a short briefing of this. Now let's let's go back to like a fact that you know I, I wanna I wanna like be candid. I really like I really wanted the conversation in Berlin because actually for those of you who don't know, we had we had an event with our uh, with a parallel academia group of the new center, which is a group of certificate students who joined us last September, who are active and you are all after the orientation will be welcome to join. They or they self organized this this event in in Berlin as part of the opening acts of Transmediale Festival, which they call it Forspiel. So we were sort of like part of the Forspiel this year at the Spike the Spike Magazine space uh, in Berlin, and we asked Manuel to come and and be the, the the closing act of this this intense day of short conversations between certificate students and their instructors, and we showed Manuel's film at the end of the day. And basically had a panel which actually lasted longer than an hour and a half. But really, I tried to take a seat back because I was I'm very active and I'm always involved. So I really didn't get a chance to engage with Manuel about the stuff I really wanted to talk about that day. And already the conversation was more than an hour and a half. So I basically thought that uh, maybe today would be a good day for me to ask you the questions I would have asked you if I was on a panel, or I would have liked to ask that day from you, which then folds back the film into the the topic of the class and the seminar we're doing the seminar we're doing here right which is basically as you know both your film and the essay art after the machines were written in the same era right like i mean it's only like five years ago but it almost feels like a century right already passed since since we were deeply addressing all that stuff right and uh, the way we did yeah so for me the most important the most important questions that I have for myself and for the seminar and the reason why we organized the seminar the way we did with these particular people is like, okay, since, since Sohail and myself and others in 2014 put forth this like radical critique of contemporary art, both political and philosophical, right? And aesthetic, what has changed and how this, how this critique has sort of like been absorbed by the, by the world of art and how certain artists have tried to, certain artists who already were not interested in producing that type of contemporary art and artists who basically been directly or indirectly influenced by these critiques and are no longer making quote unquote indeterminate art that is only phenomenologically resolved by the audience at the end and actually have positions, trajectories, directions, opinion, content, whatever you want to call it, combination of those. Yeah, how, what happened in this five years? And then what uh, the, the technological en engagement with art, art engagement with technology, how that has also like transformed art making today, both in its sort of like appearance, in its organization, but also anthropologically, which is basically that you missed the, 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 the earlier part when we talked about like the type of, anthropology of modern and contemporary art that that was kind of conceived by Greenberg in terms of like artists being able to be separate from the society at least economically if not also culturally and produce a work that bourgeoisie or the 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 the, the sort of the one percent class supports like a like a like a like an unborn baby with an umbilical cord and how has the has the technological advancement and, and basically sort of like technological, whatever you want to call it, has kind of like made any impact on anthropology of contemporary art. So these, these were the things that I, that I want to like put forth to you in light of the film. But I think before we get into that, it's, it's interesting to sort of like just, just, just briefly, briefly talk about the fact that uh, how the film came about, how you basically were the very exceptional, for me, Manuel is a very exceptional and hardworking artist and filmmaker. He should be a role model for a lot of artists. I met him when he was in his second year in the, in, in the art school. He came to 
me and introduce himself. In the night of an opening I had in Vancouver, an exhibition basically organized around ideas of um, Reza Negaristani, who is actually the, the programmer or philosophy program, and a big part of the new center now, which is now what, 2013 to 2019. It's been six years, and actually a couple of years before that. So it's been eight years that I've engaged with Reza on a, on a, on a, on a, on a serious level. So yeah, so Manuel came to me and said, oh, this, this, is a, this, is a, this seems not to be an exhibition about art and technology. I would like to interview you for this film I'm doing, right? And I just look at this kid and I said, okay. And I thought he's gonna come back with like a, like an iPhone tomorrow and, and just do some like video footage of me. And the next day he showed up with a full film crew, lighting people, mic people, everything. And just basically the gallery became like a, like a film studio. And you saw, those of you who saw the film, that actually I'm sitting in front of two diagrams by Reza Negaristani, which he used in 2012 to give this very seminal lectures about problems of computation at Miguel Abro Gallery in New York in November. So, and, and then I kind of collected those two drawings. They, they're in my personal art collection. So they were on the wall as part of the exhibition, and I and I told a man well to just like place me in front of those drawings and and shoot me, and that's where my my conversations began, right? So yeah, so this was sort of like the and then I encouraged him to travel to Berlin because Berlin Biennale was gonna open by a Colombian curator who has this like uh, sort of ethnic ethnic connection to to Manuel, but also was going to include people I knew and friends I knew. And there was another very important symposium going on in Berlin that summer around a set of ideas that later on that summer, summer the, the, the summer of 2014 became the constituting elements of the new center. So I said, you really should try to go to Berlin next summer and be there for both this conference and the Berlin Biennale and shoot more people internationally to make the film even bigger and better. And Manuel took my challenge and kind of like was able to get grants and finance himself and go there and, and so film was shot partially in Vancouver, but mostly in Berlin. And you actually see Julieta Aranda, who will be teaching next week, is one of the people who was also in the film. She also participated in a panel after the showing of the film two weeks ago in Berlin. We just haven't had a chance to edit the video and put it online. We'll make that video available too. Yeah, so basically for me, you know, like, You know, one of the ideas that I brought to the film, and that would be a good good place to start, right, was that idea of the civil war that was going on, the civil war that I said was going on between between the web and the museum spaces, right? Now, I want to like challenge you and say, so what do you think? What do you what do you think has been the fate of this this war that we can say has been ongoing in the last five years? And from someone who is not necessarily in the heart of the contemporary art world because you're a filmmaker and you made a very conscious decision to not become like a quote unquote career artist and so like stay on the sideline even though you work with art you really are are just so far have only made films how do you see this civil war evolving and developing during the last five six years and so i also have some answers for that but like i'll just let you speak first so, so I, I think a, a good way to start answering that is to link it to the two earlier uh, questions that you made in the beginning. And thank you so much for the, for the introduction, for the comments about the film. That's very generous of you, Mo, as always. Um, but I think the way that we, should, that, that we could link it is, let's start, let's start with Suhal Malik's critique of indeterminacy and where this led. Because I think this is a way that we can, uh, that we can sort of preface this, right? Um, what happened, of course, is that um, uh, Suhail Malik made this critique about exit contemporary art, which of course has gone quite viral. Uh, this happened roughly five years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and this has produced a lot of reactions. Just one sec. I just want to tell people that Sohail was represented in a film with that uh, tape player. With the recorder. Yeah, with a recorder, sorry. So, so he critiques, he critiques the, um, the indeterminacy of artworks. The surface is not able to say what the, art, what the artwork tries to do. The artwork uh, deals with, explores, but it doesn't actually do anything in a way. So this indeterminacy makes it a rely, a reliant on text or in a, you know, all sorts of descriptions that, are, that basically are created by academia and are created by you know, academia, uh, and curators, galleries, to, to sort of frame them and to be able to locate them inside, a, inside specific conversations. And I would argue even without having to actually partake in the conversations or without actually any conversation having to exist. Because a lot of it is, 
you know, people go to the exhibition, see the art, and they never never talk about it again. And this is the reality of these things. Uh, what I what I figured that has happened with a lot of the work uh, that Suhal is that Suhal Malik mm -hmm. keeps being a teacher uh, of art in Goldsmiths. So as an exit strategy, he didn't actually exit it. He just kept you know doing what he was doing, and so did everybody else. People uh, people keep making keep making in the uh, indeterminate art under the flag of Suhal Malik's critique. Uh, and the art world is absolutely just as indeterminate as anything we've seen. To, again, it just happens to critique indeterminacy, which I find <laughs> rather odd. Uh, I think one of the particular things as well is that if we go back, I mean, and this is uh, this is sort of anecdotal, but I'll, I'll put it back anyway. Um, if we think in 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 the European Middle Ages, the idea of the hermit. A hermit is somebody that dissociates him, him or herself from society and goes to a remote place, it decides to exit society. And the, the, the paradox of the hermit, of course, is that when the hermit leaves society and then somebody knows that there's a hermit that is not in society, the hermit acquires healing powers. So people from that society will go seek that hermit to be cured, to become more holy, to be more blessed, because this hermit, uh, whoever they may be, suddenly since they're outside, they acquire, you know, some form of uh, clairvoyance or, or holiness. I think it's the same that Suhal Malik tried to do, but of course he didn't actually become a hermit. He kept working in the contemporary art. He kept working as a, as a teacher. So it's always this paradigm of the hermit that, it, that is probably- He teaches right now at your university, right? Yeah, he teaches in my university. Um, and I mean, we, we've seen the art shows that have come out of this, uh, out, of, out of Suhal Malik's critique, uh, the ones that Suhal partaken on, and that other people partake, partook on. I mean, they're about financial speculation. I think he's also very cynical. Sometimes when he gives talks, he says, well, I'll talk about something else that's not art, because uh, I'm not interested in art. So he just talks about finance, which is very funny, because you could just as well hear, you know, somebody like Eli Ayashi or, or, or somebody that works, you know, in finance, instead of an artist thinking about finance. I mean, talking about regurgit regurgitation and specialization. Um, so so I'm, I'm very cynical about that. I think that there is this image in the film at the end where there's an a receipt going around in an escalator. Let me just interject, and I'm going to try to bring my volume down because I, I people are saying that like there's a big dis uh, disparity between your volume and mine. Your volume is low and mine is high, so I just have to speak a little bit less excited and quiet. I think... I think I think Sohail has made a uh, Sohail's critique and the frame of reference that uh, Peter Osborne, as someone who's been in conversation with Sohail actually, have set for contemporary art, have made a sort of like impact on, on the art, but I'm not necessarily sure that it's been 100% positive. And I think this kind of like basically is your point, right? But I think, I think the artists like, the artists that me and Patrick picked for this seminar are actually people who I think have done something positive or something productive with that critique of contemporary art. Because I think there is a way to utilize the Sohail's critique for the right purpose. And I and, and in a way, you know, one of the one of the one of the one of the artistic practices that Sohail really embraces is is, is forensic architecture. Because every time when it, when it got to the example of okay Sohail, who do you like? He would say for example, forensic architecture, right? So, so in a way, you're right now in a department and work with people that Sohail actually holds up as an example of good art, which is artwork that sort of like has socio-political content, engages technology deeply, deals with the, with the question of our time, and basically produces not just content, but new epistemologies, right? It's totally like, so, so of all people, you should be a little bit more, you should be a little bit more, so like, so sort of like a uh, uh, generous towards towards so so help because because of see where see where this critique take took you as someone who were sort of like aware of it and in fact made a movie around it right I'm not done yet that but also I think uh, you know because because you know what I mean unfortunately we have so much to do and we only have about uh, no we still have an hour and ten minutes left right yeah so yeah so so go ahead if you want to say something. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I do think that Suhal's critique was very important uh, at the moment, and at that at that particular moment, uh, it it became apparent that that one had to try to think of different ways to make art. Well, I mean, the case of forensic architecture is different because they they predate uh, Suhal's critique, so Suhal would would appreciate the work I think a posteriori. 
So it, it, it was not worth it was done reflecting on Sohal's critique. Uh, no, 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 no. In, 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 fact, in fact, I think the, the forensic, in a way, forensic architecture, in a way, inspired Sohail to yeah. sort of like formulate his ideas because they are friends. They hang out in London, right? So they're like very close friends. So I would assume that 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 when you when you when you when you when you experience Al's work, it'll transform you, and it had some kind of transformative effect on Sohail's ideas about what contemporary art is and what it ought to be. Uh -huh. No, and I, and, I, and, I, and I think it's interesting. What, what my, problem, my problem is not so much with Suhal's critique, but with the people that make the same artwork reflecting on Suhal Malik's work, which I find that, you know, it's, it's Rasana Garistani's human centipede. It, it, it has not changed. I mean, for, for me, it's, it's, it's not about, it, like if you make if you take that critique and you go make indeterminate artwork and put it in a white cube that you know works it works operates thinks about art in the same way then you're doing the same thing you're repeating it so so i guess i guess that's one of the questions the other question that you asked was about anthropologically how has the art world changed anthropologically mm -hmm. well i think the way a lot of the ways that the art world has changed anthropologically and this includes me and i think this includes a lot of people is that cinema became cheaper and because uh, the way that, that making films uh, has become more popularized in the last, you know, 10 years or whatever, uh, has allowed artists to think about making films. I think a lot of times artists are get, get you know, tired personally for extra wide reason of the, of the limitations of the white keep. It's, I mean, I would say that it's a space that it's often very sterile for, for an intense discursive engagement. Um, and this is why a lot of times the artist talks or seminars or, you know, these kind of things are more useful, but also films. A lot of artists are making films. Uh, we see it more and that's, more. That's a, that's, a very good, that's a very good point. Actually, Patrick, as someone who studied with Harun Faroki, I think you would say that, well, filmmaking predates, like, internet in a way. Like, like actually not filmmaking, like essay film and film as art, right? So how do you think about this? What do you think about this? This sort of like the artist, like th there has been a return to essay film in the last ten years, right? Like we've talked about this, right? And Manuel basically saying that the the sort of like one of the ways in which we can talk about what has happened since since Sohail's critique is like the artist going to film. Also, that coincides with like film film production becoming more democratic and cheaper, right? So, how do you see? What do you see in this? What is the value of this? Everybody wanting to make uh, make art films. Because I know your, your cynicism and critique can be useful here. I think it is similar to people uh, building, trying to build uh, Roman temples in classicism. That's what artists nowadays doing uh, essay films, which is a form coming out of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and then going down in the 80s, 90s. Uh, that's how I see it. That I, I, I see it as media classicism. I mean, explain it. Yeah, because it, it, it is a form that is, has already had a start in history. In the 50s? Yeah, and, and, and then in and, and an end point, then you can say, okay, it started in the 60s and it ended in the 90s. That, that, that is not the question here. We're not talking about hysteri hysteriography. We are talking about that it is already has a start and an end point. And now... But what's wrong with artists trying to revive it as a way of getting away from correlationism, getting away from making work that is indeterminate, and trying to do something meaningful that is actually can contribute to the development of new epistemologies. Let's let's let, let's use the example of a carrot, carrot or a tomato soup. While well, carrot soups and tomato soups are amazing, going to the the store and buying. Uh, some powder and mixing it with hot water doesn't make a really good soup. I, I think I disagree. Some of the some of the people who are who are making I mean one is sitting in front of you. I think that the two films I've seen from Manuel are a great example of how how essay film can be repurposed and I and, think... and so like brought brought to address the problem of contemporary art and it's not just Manuel because we're gonna be dealing with uh, Marwa you know, Julieta sometimes make films. 
uh, uh, mostly, you know. Pardon me? She mostly makes films. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and uh, uh, other artists, I don't know, like John Gerard in a way. I mean, John Gerard makes like make make clocks and sculptures. You can't really call it film, even though it is kind of like video. But like, but yeah. So 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 like like, I don't think everyone going back to essay film is is using like a like a ready made soup. No, no, no. I don't. I, uh, I I agree with you completely here. But I don't think that Manuel. Julieta or Mawa are doing essay film. If you look at it from a film theoretical, film so historical, what are they doing? they're doing something new that film historians in now and film theoricians uh, will de uh, define. And they will define it in a way that they will put it its own marker in the history of film production and art video production. And going back to, let's say, uh, the early, uh, early uh, silence of, uh, of, of the Lumiere brothers, uh, is, 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 is nice to look at it. But if I now do a silent film, I would not call it uh, silent film. A, a, a silent film a la the, the Lumiere brothers. I would have to engage in uh, creating an old media media ontology from for, for that. Okay, so, fair enough. I would, say, I, would, I, would, I would say something that there is there are some artists, I mean of course there's a lot of artists that use film as well whose work I'm not particularly attracted to but there are artists that I think uh, are making uh, films that are more, much more interesting than the films filmmakers are making. Uh, I mean, some ideas, and I know they're problematic, but you know, we can work with the problems and you know, take what they offer. Is for example, Levi Leviathan by Lucian Carson Taylor and Verena Par Paravel. Can instance. you please type it on the sidebar too, so people can research it later? But I would have to, like, you know. Uh, yeah, no, we do. We do that for you. I'll You're on it. the phone. I forgot. Sorry. I'm in an iPad and I can't really, I don't really know how to use it. It's not mine, I borrowed it. So, uh, Lucien Carson Taylor and Verena Paravel made Leviathan. I think that film, when I first saw it, it definitely it offered a totally new way to not only think about filmmaking, but a totally different new way of making films. It's an immersive sensory ethnography documentary of uh, a ship that's fishing in, you know, I mean, I, I, I was very, I was very moved by that. I don't know about their new films and the last films they've been making. Some of them are interesting, some of them are not. Uh, you know, coming from that same school, Laura Huertas Mijan, who's, you know, racing to prominence right now. Right now. She's a young Colombian filmmaker. She works mostly with documentaries, uh, ethnographic fiction documentaries. Of course, uh, ethnography is a colonial, uh, it's a colonial practice. And what, what she's trying to do is to turn it into a decolonial practice by adding fiction to it and by fictionalizing, like showing that in every sort of a colonial um, attempt to make films, there's, of course, a but you know, a I, fictional... I, I privilege Leviathan because Leviathan really deals with the questions I raised back in 2015 in Art After the Machines. It really does because it offers, it offers a complete new way of looking at the world that is non-human centered. Right, you could almost call it like animal filmmaking, right? Absolutely. Or machine filmmaking, or animal machine filmmaking, right? And I think this film Dao that's going to open in London, the film installation project by that Russian artist Dao that we were talking about oh. it. I think I'm really looking forward to see what this guy oh, with right. a huge project is. It's, it's opening very soon. I think it's in February. Oh, I have to. going to come to Paris too in March and. Uh, no, I think it's March in London. I think first opens in February in Paris and then goes to March. But but anyways, I wanted to like talk about an aspect of, and then and then maybe we can like uh, I mean we're five minutes behind, but I think that's fine. Sorry. I wanted to like talk five minutes about like I think one of the anthropological impact of anthropological impact of like the the further engagement of art with technology, but also technologies like further deep 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 penetration of the society through social media, mostly, but through sort of like these automated algorithmic processes to which life and communication are subjected to, has been, uh, you know, a lot of the black boxed and camouflaged and unclear processes of how art is being made, how careers are being made, how 
how stars are being made is becoming more and more transparent. Absolutely. And it bec it's very e it's much easier for people to see how this whole machine called art world works. And this is against the intended effect of communication. We've and noticed that art world poor people, basically. This is so clear now. What, what did you say? It's, it's become so clear that, our, that the art world hates poor people. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean that's a that's a different issue, right? But what I'm talking about is what I'm talking about is it it it's very clear now to most people who who follow artists or follow museums online or follow galleries online and then follow other stories that that come up in art press and gets perpetuated in a, in the media that like really how does the system work? So what what happens and this is like what of our interest is that. The myth of art, the myth of modern art, the myth of contemporary art is completely becoming like demythologized. The art is becoming the myth. And this is actually a, a big, I think, if the crisis of contemporary art in 2014 was indeterminacy, the fact that the art really didn't mean much and it required the audience to go and complete it, it basically stayed vague on the sideline and kind of like, um, let people kind of define it and kind of said, oh, this is just this and that. I think that crisis, even though that crisis has been addressed by uh, artists, going back to the question of social and political, some of them actually getting out of gallery and doing actual stuff, like your friend who actually started this, this, this like small farming, you know, redoing real stuff, like actually creating, you said, you said basically they make this cheese, right? That is very good and basically sustaining this, this sort of artistic experiment. Uh, if you put the if 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 I get the names later, we can all add all these references to the Fernando Garcia Dori. Uh, say it again. Fernando Garcia Dori. Yeah, uh, Fernando Garcia Dori. I actually hung out with him in Guangzhou I think, in 2016. I think it's a technological artist in a way because what he actually is doing is hacking the art world. He's applying for grants and for money from the art world and he's taking it out and giving it yeah. to communities to create models of development. So, so, so despite of the, the fact that a whole slew of artists are basically bypassing the question of contemporary art and, and, the, and, the, and the white cube indeterminacy, right? I think the demythologization of the contemporary art that applies to all the artists, those who are still indeterminate or those who are not, kind of has, for me, is defining the new crisis of contemporary art. The new crisis of contemporary art is that it's it's mythless, mm -hmm. and and entities that do not engage with myth kind of like lose their significance, mm -hmm. lose their importance. And this is today very reflective in sort of like low turnout in the galleries, even commercial galleries. Right now, blockbuster shows are getting more and more people, but actual art that is like art for art people is uh, is getting less this exhibition that we participated in in eindhoven uh, called robot love actually i was very excited about it because the topic of the exhibition was something that i've really like been passionate about for a long time i wrote an essay for the catalog reza contributed to the catalog katarina kolozova another instructor in the new center wrote a really lovely essay for it and we went down there to install our, our, basically we had a little show inside a larger exhibition. The exhibition was called Robot Love. And then we had basically the second part of artificial cinema, which we did the first part of it in Prague in 2016. We did the second, an upgrade to artificial cinema. And actually the, the whole nonprofit society that was doing these kind of like Biennale like exhibitions in Netherlands, kind of like declared bankruptcy because of low turnout, basically the number of tickets that they, they meant to sell did not sell enough. And basically they went into huge depth with artists and people who produced the exhibition and they had to declare bankruptcy to dump the, basically what do you call a financial responsibility, right? So really to me, these problems that are popping up, you know, like New York galleries closing, mid-sized galleries are constantly closing. Power, let me just finish. Power of the top galleries becoming more concentrated and mid-sized galleries kind of finding themselves in a, in, in, in a crunch. To, to me, it has not all, but at least some, if not very much, has to do with the loss of this myth that has to do with the fact that technology and social media demythologized art. Exactly. And this, this, you guys out there in the class, it's sort of like what, what, what I think we should take on in the, in the final project we're doing.
basically in this exercise that we will we will later on explain to you and hopefully this collaborative project that we will all work on should be in a way an attempt to uh, inject mythology or come up with new myths new myths to and hence you know what I mean this is again to go back to forensic architecture why everybody's interested in forensic because forensic architecture comes with a new set of mythology about what it does and how it sort of like help help the society while coming up with new new forms. This is what actually is this. You know, yesterday I was I was looking at the the one the list of one hundred powerful people in the arts, and Al Wiseman had shot up from number ninety four to like number eight or something. Like it, it's like it's like I was like wow, look, it even this it this sort of like importance is is recognized in in such a list. So for me, that is something that that we can maybe sort of like work on a little bit in this seminar. Go ahead. I, I, I would even say that, you know, a lot of people say that forensic architecture is not art. And I mean, of course, this is not what they what they say, but I say, yeah, great, it's not art. Then, you know, what is it? It's even better. Is it, isn't it great that it's not art? Maybe it's not art, who cares? This, these distinctions are, you know, so useless right now. It's like, what we have to think is, you know, a lot, a lot of artists are, uh, you know, established artists are stopping their practice or putting their practice on the side and are starting restaurants and they're not even calling it relational aesthetics. They just call it restaurant, you know, and what's the problem with that, you know? So it's about, it's about the, the mythologizing the art world. Of course, there's no mythology right now. I think nobody in the art world right now that's any engaged or with any lucidity thinks that what they're doing is important. I think nobody... Uh, really believes this, even if they tell you they do, I don't think anybody believes the art world is important. Uh, and this is because of the lack of myth that you're saying. So what do we say? Okay, do we create another myth? Do we maybe just, you know, keep doing whatever it is that we're doing and we try to, you know, use the art world as, as just another platform for circulation, which is what I think it's becoming. The art world is just, you know, it's just a website, you know, you just put things in the wall because maybe you need, you know, whatever, you know, the $2,000 that they give you for the fee. And this is fine. I think it may be, it, just think about the art world as just, as just like a really precarious way to make a living uh, or to like exhibit things and then do do whatever it is that you really want to do on the side. You don't actually need to engage the art world. Just, you know, there's so many more interesting things in the world that you can engage. And this is the, the prophylaxis that Alex Galloway tried to, you know, critique. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know, here, here it comes. So, but, but this is, this is the exact same terrible precarious world in which all of us are still excited to participate and you know i'm not going to get get i'm not going to get uh, like specific into like into like personal information but i know and you know that you are also very much interested in participating in this world i even have like empirical information of it from the last our last last few days engagement and like your plans for the next few years and all that right so it's like it's like we can be cynical about it but but somehow at the same time we're still attracted to this world and we still want to somehow engage it in a hope of transforming it in the hope of making a mark in it in, in a hope of making our living through it and you know it's not just me it's like actually people who are in a seminar in the same boat now speaking of them i think maybe it's good if you can try to like see if people have some questions from me from you and from manuel because soon we have to like basically wrap up by by basically a little bit of a conversation about the art after the machines Yes. And then the, the the not the assignment. I mean, yes, the, the the basically the the readings and all that, and the 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 final project. Yeah. You know, so. I want to add one more thing, if that's okay. I didn't mean to be cynical. I, I I don't really think of this as a cynical position. I think of it as a as a constructive position. I think it, it's it's useful that now the different ways of engaging the art world have opened and they're on the table. We start thinking of, of how to engage it. And a lot of times that engagement comes from not engaging the traditional ways of, of producing art. So, uh, dear students, if you have any uh, questions, please uh, unmute yourself and... Uh, also, maybe turn your camera on. Yes. Anybody wants to, wants to engage Manuel or myself or uh, Patrick? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so um, I really enjoyed the film and uh, the reading as well. And uh, I just, I have a film that's kind of a film essay. Uh, I don't know if, if you guys saw it when I applied to the school. Um, 
and I, ha I have some writing on a very similar topic about um, this, which is covered a little bit in the film about uh, how uh, super literary uh, the art world has become with buzzwords and philosophy words and this kind of jargon. Uh, I noticed there was a part of the film that was quite fun where that started to really take over in this like overwhelming way. Um, anyway, I have a I have a kind of similar film essay. I'd love to share it with you guys. I don't know. Absolutely. If, you if, you, if, if it's online, please put the link on the sidebar. We're going to post all the notes from the sidebar into the Google Classroom. And of okay. course, we can even open, open another particular entry for that in which people can engage it, basically, like on its own, outside okay. of the sidebar. Great, but, but, yeah. But any okay. other comments or questions? Uh, I, I really enjoyed the film and the writing. It was great. And um, yeah. yeah. About know, the just... writing, let, let's just take, a ch t take the time and discuss writing. The writing process for that piece itself is kind of like a, col with a collaborative. Col I'm going to like mute you if you don't mind. Okay. Alejandro, and then you can unmute if you want to speak. Yeah. The writing process for that was that actually that began as a Facebook chat. This is something that we're going to like try to recreate in part of the the, the collaborative project we do here, but but using a spreadsheet. Patrick will go over that later. So basically, I started the conversation on Facebook between selected people that I thought their opinion on the matter is important. There were like 10 people. They're named in the intro to the text. And basically, for about two months, we discussed what's wrong with contemporary art in relation to technology, right? And then at the end of the two months, I said thank you to them. I copy-pasted that, put it into Word, got rid of all the names because I wasn't interested at all where they come from. So I immediately forgot who said what. And then I began shrinking and editing it down and then began giving it, like basically using it as my own opinion. Basically, basically. so if I agreed with you, your statement will remain as it was. If, if you disagreed with me, I would change the verb from yes to no, from positive to negative or from negative to positive. And I will basically reword the sentence. So I will retain your rhetoric while I would inject my own intention and meaning into it. And basically, it took a long time for it to go from that long text on Facebook to become something publishable. And then it basically came out as part of Eflux's participation in the 2015 Venice Biennale, where like they put a billboard in front of the main pavilion, and every day they publish one text in the magazine, in the online journal, and an excerpt of it was enlarged and put on the sculpture as like a, like a billboard for people to read as they were going in and out. And the longer essay was online and the short version was on the wall, on, on the wall in, on the, on the sculpture in, in, in Venice. And then the interesting thing was that us, the new center collaborated with Eflux and we got one of our, one of our members or students to respond to that text and create a secondary text that was in response to that. And that got published on both Eflux conversations and on the New Center website. So there is a response to my text by someone. I forgot who responded to mine, but the piece basically included about 100, 100 people like me contributed to super community. And then 100 New Center people responded to them as super conversations. So, but my piece was the only one that didn't have a single author, even though it had me as the sort of like a curator of the conversation or the manipulator of the conversation. So that's how that text came about that you did you say, and I was going to say this later, but I thought maybe it's good to just put it on a table. And I talk about this because I think we're going to like adopt a similar methodology for composing what we're going to do for the, for the seminar at the end as like the, as like both a requirement assignment, but also an interesting collaborative project for to do every of you, including Patrick. So any other question from me or from, uh, from Manuel, anybody wants to talk? I have, a, I have a question. Can you all hear me? Yes, go ahead, William. It's Thank yours. Um, the door is yours. Um, I'm wondering. Um, I don't know. I like. Um, y'all are talking about. Um, I guess like the like uh, particularly Leviathan, like a like a machine animal mm, art making or filmmaking. But I'm wondering. Um, and I won't be able to say this that eloquently, but like I'm, I'm wondering what it would mean in that regard that there's still kind of a will to like make that. So like I think that we all have, especially in the context of the art market, there's like an ideological dimension of like wanting to be successful. 
But like, what would be like the, the wanting to make something like Leviathan? Because if it is in some way non-human, like what does it mean that I still desire to want to be able to make that? Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think, I think for me, the desire is production of knowledge and production of new epistemologies. I don't do it just to make some money, even though it would be great to make money, but to actually contribute to basically, first and foremost, as like as an artist's artist like how greenberg puts it contribute to the development of artistic methodologies therefore thus hopefully new epistemologies of art but hopefully even go further and basically as i suggest in the text provide a kind of pedestal or example through which other for other knowledge producers can actually kind of be encouraged to kind of get out of their own box and produce knowledge in their own field, which is something that, say, an artist can only pretend to be doing, you know, artist as historian, artist as anthropologist, artist as sociologist, artist as activist, artist, as, you know, like these, these hats have been worn by artists in the last 20, 30 years, right? But actually, by contributing to my own field, by expanding it, particularly in this direction that you brought up, I would not only create new epistemologies for art, but hopefully encourage and provide set examples or set a pedestal, if you want to use that metaphor, for, for people in other fields to also follow and do so. You know, very much, I'm very much interested in, in sort of like a humble kind of art that is understandable by machine, which is very like, very like, very much like saying like, our future machines will need art in a way. It's very science fiction to think about it. But actually, it's not that much. You know what I mean? Because if you if you if you think of like all forms of like text to like a speech to text recognition, image recognition, and all these technologies that are rapidly be being developed, they're all feeding into the production of a machine consciousness and a machine unconsciousness, like immediately that will that will gradually gradually develop into into a form of being that might require art for its own contemplation. I agree. I, agree. I think maybe it's maybe story. Lauren maybe Lauren is turning her mic off. His mic off. Okay, I Lauren. Question. Yeah, I have two questions actually. Go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so the two yes. questions I have is in this venue, I'm wondering how we're talking about modes of being together otherwise. However, the ways in which uh, the artwork that we're just talking and presenting about is being presented is very much still wrapped in the production of the individual artist and the ways in which networking is operating in this venue is very, um, like it's very networky, right? In the way that we're discussing the names of who it is we've worked with and how. And I'm wondering what that does to um, think about a mode of being together otherwise. And secondly, I wanted to talk about a little bit more about how the art world hates poor people. Can we talk a bit more about <laughs> what you mean when you say that, what kinds of access are available um, what it means to make something democratized or not. Um, those are two questions I have. Is that, is that from Manuel or are you asking me? Uh, I would actually like to hear both of your opinion on that, but I think that Manuel was the one that brought it up. Yes, Manuel will, uh, let, let's leave Manuel to address the, the hardest hate poor people thing because that's his thing and I don't necessarily disagree with him, but I think, I think, I think you know, wait, 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 Let, let's just deal with the first question. I take the first question. Um, and Lauren, when you said this venue, you meant the new center and the seminars here, or you meant like the generally the space of contemporary art? I guess I mean right now. I'm wondering like, yeah, this venue here. Uh, okay, so I mean, I mean, it's impossible to have all the microphones open at the same time because we're gonna create just yeah, like- I can turn right off. No, 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 I'm saying like, if you want everybody to participate, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to take your conversation first to this technological challenge, right? Okay, what it means if we can have all of us contributing. So immediately I'm thinking all the mics are on and everybody's speaking and then nobody can understand anything. So, so we, we, we need to unfortunately kind of like compartmentalize and say, okay, now Mohammed speaking and then it's going to be Patrick and then it's going to be Manuel and then it's going to be somebody else. So, so that part of it is really like, you know what I mean? There's nothing we can do, but... But beyond that, if you explain a little bit more, maybe I can maybe I can have a response. 
Sure. I mean, I guess I'm thinking about it in terms of like Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed, right? Like the ways in which this classroom format that we're set up in right now is that the students that are here are meant to be good containers for you to, as a teacher, fill, right? And I'm wondering if there's a possibility because of this horizontal format that we're in because of the digital space for us to actually engage in some type of conversation. And well, I wonder why it is that you're like, or what, I mean, maybe it's that I don't know the format of the center enough. Yeah, well, the thing is, but I'm wondering, um, the Maybe thing is, now I know what you're talking about. No, yes. the, the, the thing is, I actually am trying to be like, I'm trying to be with this first session very like, sort of like what they call it, like actually generous because other sessions will end up being a lot more conversational. So I really wanted the first session to be a kind of orientation rather than just like mm -hmm. leave it open. So at least the frame is set. And then in, 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 the, in the coming sessions, through presentations and responses, right? Mm -hmm. Basically the time is divided between the, the artists who will come in and present a set of methodologies and show some work and the students yeah. who, then, who then engage both as a main presenter, which will present on the material provided to you before, and then in the form of another respondent and mm -hmm. then the discussions that follow. So the time is actually totally divided that way and the format of the coming sessions is much more student conversation. But really, we've, we've, we insist on sort of like a conversational model. We, we have limited the student, student uh, numbers to 13 because we can move to another platform in which uh, you get more students in and just as audience. But we've kept it this way so we can have like real conversation going. If most of the time, it's about us asking people to speak and them not wanting to speak and wanting to be lectured at which is very i'm totally with you on this i'm completely yeah. completely interested in actually using this horizontal space to make this more conversational sometimes also it's about the instructor because some instructors like the lecture format more but i am on the side of let's change that and let's make it more sort of like collaborative knowledge production why not yeah and i mean and i understand that there's i mean the idea of anything being horizontal is obviously a false false idea right because this is not a horizontal format even though we can say it is um but it, there's also a question about um like what how is it the way that we're and even in the way that both you and manuel are discussing the kind of production of the artists that we're just that we're, that we're that we're talking about right and this is also like a larger question that i'm interested in is like how do we share knowledge with each other and how do we talk about what's happening in the, sen the sense of the contemporary in a way that um doesn't privilege the one artist as having the idea or something like that and the way that we're discussing this still is operating in that way, if you understand what I mean. So I'm wondering how can we, and maybe this is like too big of a question for this format, but I think that there's something about, it's still very rooted in the networks that all of you are discussing that we may or may not be a part of. Well, you are, unfortunately you are becoming part of it now. So it's like, it's like, there's, <laughs> there's no one back, right? But, but also like, the, like uh, I've been, I've been totally on this, on this, on this track for the last, at least like a month and a half, two months that like uh, basically sort of like how to dismantle the, the star system. Right. And not, 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 not just through sloganeering and saying like, you know what I mean? Star, our stars are bad or like we don't need art stars, but how to like deeply, deeply dismantle the, 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 the star system in the art world. It's a real big problem that needs to be tackled. And I think I think one of the ways, one of one of the ways, you know, this is this is the way. Also, you have to talk about it because we all have star friends, and when you tell them you want to dismantle art system, the star system, they go like, "Oh my god!" They want to like shoot me, like like Andy Warhol was shot. It's like no, nobody wants to shoot you, but but my metaphor for it, and it actually came up last night too in a conversation we had with the people who are running this wonderful residency which we worked with last year, Digital Earth, is that rather than a star system, we need to move towards constellations and constellations are basically are made up of some brighter some not as bright stars but in a constellation the star does not matter what matters is the constellation that these big and small point of light make together so i think even as maybe not as a final goal but as an intermediary 
space, it's good to conceptualize what does it mean to have a constellation of artists rather than artist stars, right? And how these constellations can come together to do stuff. And really, let's make this seminar an experiment in that. I'm super open and, and, and like open about it. And let's just try to like exercise that here. If you, especially if you're interested and other people are interested. How, and this, this participatory project that we're gonna work on together can actually be a good example of how we can do that. And it actually comes out of the, 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 the seminar that last year, uh, this philosopher from France who teaches with us, Anne-Francois Schmidt, basically did this. And we loved her methodology that we're actually adopting it for our seminar today. That we're basically saying like, let's go with Anne-Francois model and basically see if we can actually create something that none of us can put their name on. And also how I did that text was kind of like that, but unfortunately they still wanted the author name if Lux wanted it to be my text, right? Because I was much more happy to just give it away as what it was. And that's why I opened the text with including all those names in it because I'm not into like any kind of like, like I, I don't believe in the myth of the single human at all whatsoever. So now, Emmanuel, do you want to talk about Art World Hates Poor People? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually paraphrasing you. Uh, this is something that, you, that you, I think you said in Berlin last, like, two weeks ago. Sorry, Maybe speak not, louder. Um, yeah, but, can sorry? you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. Speak up a little bit or get closer to the microphone. Sorry, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm like, using this, like, uh, this thing. Like, no, what I, what I say is that you see a lot of people that should have a better career, so they should be paying more, more attention to, and that you see that because of their social class, the, the art world has not really become more democratic. People are still being barred from participating. Uh, of course, especially I say that about people that I know in Colombia that are doing incredible jobs with the incredible work, but they don't have access to, you know, to a form of career. Also, like what we see is that, you know, the art world has become, I mean, the mechanism of like making an artist has become very transparent, as Mo was saying. And this mechanism, of course, reveals that, in fact, um, a lot of times, like making career decisions has is becoming more important than than it is to have original new ideas. I mean, of course, like the professionalization of artists that are doing. You know, that's because the object object. That's because the, the the object that preoccupies the artist's mind is not the art, is the career, which exactly. itself is like conceptual, right? Imagine like saying like, I don't care about what I make. The, my object of concern is my career. So I'll do anything for it, right? I would like paint, I would draw, I would do installation, I would make film, I would lie, I would kiss ass, sorry for bad language. I would do anything because the object is the career that matters, not the art. But I think this is very hard for the art world to acknowledge that in the last 25, 30 years, the most important object in the art world is not art object, but it's the artist's career that is the center attention of basically everyone's kind of like activities, right? But the only thing people talk about also, it's just outrageous. When you go to Have you not school. saying those things you were telling me in Berlin about like why, why artists hate poor people? I think maybe you should just directly put out our conversation we had last week. Uh, well, you know, like you, you go to places and just- No, basically, basically maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'll answer it for you because maybe you forgot your answer because you had a very beautiful answer. You basically said, it's, it emanates from self-hate because artists are poor and they don't want to be poor. So on a very first level, the, the kind of like disgust we have for poor people is the disgust we have for our own condition of life because, and the fact that then, the, and back to Greenberg, because we see like the prospect of selling art to rich people as the only way to get out of this, we start identifying with people that we want to pay attention to us so then that's the second layer of why, why artists don't like poor people. It's like, A, they don't like their own condition, and B, they identify with the, with the values and aspiration of those who they want to impress, right? And remember? So now yeah. if you want to add to that, go ahead. Yeah, that's good. No, you're, you're, you're right. That's, 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 the, that's where the conversation came from. And, and you know, it's also like, because the, the, the object of most people's careers, is, of most people's art, is, is their career. And the reason is because, of course, it emanates from the conditions of precarity, uh, the incredible amounts of unpaid labor, the, you know, I mean, and, and people, of course, people are stressed about how are they going to make a living? So then people like start making films or people open restaurants or people because they, they find that there's other ways of, you know, of engaging 
you know, creativity or, you know, new epistemological production. Or sometimes they give up on that altogether. They just say, okay, it's not important. Even established artists, you know, it's... Um, and I think it's fine. I mean, it's fair. I mean, of course, everybody can do whatever they want. And this is, well, the, this thing, is the, the, the thing about, uh, to go back to, to, to the material I covered, what the, the magic of Greenberg was saying, like, within my, con within my system, you can, you can hate yourself for being poor. You can hate poor people. You can also still hate rich people, even though you will depend on them, right? So that's what, that, that's what the umbilical core of gold does. Sort of, sort of. Lauren, way. do you want to say something? Yeah, but I, I do. Um, but I think that that whole constellation has that whole like system has come to a come to an abrupt end. It does not work anymore. Greenberg's, Greenberg Greenberg's model is no longer working, and that's why we're here. Go ahead. Well, that is that is no longer working. But also, um, at this moment, I mean, I've started to understand the ways in which artists operate under precarity as a system of control. Right. So as long as we understand ourselves as being a precarious subjects and continuing to the only ways in which we have a kind of positive affect was when I say that. And then all of us are like, oh, I'm also super precarious. Right. And then that's how precarity operates. But most of the time it's like, you know, how are we going to pay rent? How are we going to produce our work? Like and so this idea that our, the art world hates poor people, there is an incredible amount of privilege, though, to get to the place of even being in this conversation that all has come to, towards all of us, whether it's been because we've desired it or whatever, um, or we've worked really hard or, you know, we had people that helped us out. But it, it like I still um, I think that when you say the art world hates poor people, I agree with you. I think that there's questions about like how it operates, though. Right. Like, does, does it hate poor people because we operate in a different linguistic um, like the, because there's a shared language that we're all speaking that is not translatable. What is our responsibility to make that translatable? How do we actually go about democratization of the arts? I mean, and I think I, I don't know what the answer is, but thinking about this idea of like us all operating within this precarious situation, and then we still have the same production of stardom, which I don't think is separate from this conversation of poor, rich, star, I don't know. I'm coming with a lot of questions about this. Maybe you guys have some more thoughts. Not, not to worry. Yeah, you're, 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 you're totally like entitled. Now, the, the thing is, if we continue discussing this stuff, the, the, the seminar will have to run a little bit over time in order to basically, the most important part is that uh, maybe, maybe in the background, those of you who are not fully engaging can begin looking at the artist, artist and, and basically pick two dates with the two of the artists that you want to engage with. So, so when it comes to like actually getting those, getting that part done in the sidebar, we can just quickly do it, right? But, the, but, but because you know what I mean, it's time to actually say goodbye to Manuel because I don't want to take up more than an hour of his time, and then, and then, and then move back to the second, to the last part of the seminar. But, but we can discuss this. Everybody think it's important. Who, who like, who, who wants to continue discussing the stuff? Who wants to move on to like the, the bureaucratic side? I'm open to both, and I don't mind if the seminar lasts longer. Yes. We can go up to three hours before the, the video gets compromised in terms of the way it compresses. And because uh, Google Hangout recommends that the sessions are under three hours, right? Yes. Yeah. So as long as it's under three hours, we're OK. OK. I, I do have to go, though, because I have to like keep working on these things. But is there any last questions or any comments before I? I just want to say. Uh that I can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Very nice uh, meeting you. Thanks. So it's uh, so kid here. Um, I I did really enjoy the film. Um, I and I appreciate you putting that together. Um, and I just you know quickly uh, wanted to kind of open. It, it, one of the things that Patrick was saying that really kind of caught me off was was the idea that maybe uh, that film is is uh, or and specifically we were talking about essay films uh, that that it is maybe kind of uh, it's something that's been done and I and I think uh, of course it, it's part of it is 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 not only the form or the medium but it's also the, the the presentation of it right if you create a film that's that's you know a uh, uh, you know a full length feature film that with the intent of showing it at at, at film festivals, then that is a thing that is potentially that there is a direct correlation there with maybe what's been going on since the 60s in essay film. But if you look at the broader 
you know, transmedia experience of, of you know, essay videos, of, of social videos, short, you know, short form, volatile Snapchat videos, Instagram stories, you know, YouTuber discourse. I still think there is room for this new way of, or a new form of, of essay film and, and dialogue that is, is not kind of in living in the past. It is very much in the now, ways of communicating that, that, that are new. Absolutely, I, and 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 I will and I will I will add I will add some anecdot anecdotal content to it. The, the current project that I'm working on, well, one of the two projects that I'm working on is uh, uh, basically a fiction ethnography in Mexico that I work with actors. But a lot of the material is found is uh, source material uh, of this specific neighborhood inside of Mexico City that I that I basically work in for like a year uh, and the, the only way that i can actually make this this way is because there are new uh, spy or, or let's not call it spy let's call, let's call it what it is a uh, open source intelligence software that can allow me to geolocate a uh, google image uh, google videos or images or whatever it gets posted online uh, through the place that it gets posted so you could you could post a uh, video and name it whatever and I will be able to find where it was uploaded. So I can find uh, basically all the videos that are being posted in that, na in that neighborhood and use it to create an ethnography, like this, this fiction ethnography that is people representing themselves. So of course, I mean, like, it's, it's about found footage as well. It's about uh, finding new ways to engage, about using new technologies to be able to produce different forms of cinema or different forms of content creation that maybe, maybe they can only be open right now because they were not, they were, they were not available before. Yes, you could not actually do this like you know three years ago and it seems very simple it's just finding what people are you know filming with their phones you know thank you so any other question before manuel leaves okay manuel thank you very much for your thank you so much that's amazing i hope you guys yeah. have a really good seminar yes also see you soon in london absolutely take yeah. care bye Okay, so, so yeah, so uh, Patrick, do you want to like uh, get to your notes and maybe talk a little bit about art after the machines, or should we just go first to the assignment because we ran out of time? I think you should go to the assignment. Okay, let's just do the assignments first. Okay, so, yeah. so in terms of in terms of assignments, everyone, the best is those who are present will pick two people to to engage with and and sort of like do presentation on, right? And also you pick two people to respond to, right? Yes. So basically presentations are, presentations are basically direct engagement with the material that you receive from the artist, right? Like say for instance, you would do a 15 minute presentation on art after the machines, but we decided to like not overwhelm you and give you that to so do, we decided to present it ourselves, right? So that will be a presentation, right? And then responses are spontaneous responses to the presentation based on the fact that you spend some time with the material too, right? And they're five minutes. So you will sign up for two presentations and two responses. Presentations are about the artists, two of the artists, responses are spontaneous responses to those presentations by your peers and classmates so that's clear right so uh if we can come up with all that today in in 20 minutes it will be amazing but the dates are on the seminar seminar a link i can also if you don't have it i can send you the seminar link and if we don't wrap it up today we will email you we will basically like harass you with emails in the next 24 48 hours until everyone is set that what it is and what is what are the presentations that they're doing which artists and which which days they will respond to of course when you pick your responses you should also think about the artist to which you want to respond right because in a way you are responding to that artist but only tangentially you're directly responding to the presentation of your peer so two presentations two responses we need four names from each one of you hopefully it would all be here before we say goodbye. Now, if you look at the sidebar, Razwan already posted the link to the seminar. That's where you get all the names 
and the dates that these artists will be doing presentations here. So, so just please figure that out. Now, on top of that, we're going to do this other exercise, right? The assignment. This assignment is basically the final assignment, and it will be due one week after the last seminar, right? Yes. It's due one week after the last seminar, and this assignment is basically uh, will be a collaborative project, and in the very last part will involve a programmer who will come in and will try to do something, work with us, to develop some kind of presentation for its final output, correct? Yes. Now, do you want to explain what is this assignment and how people can participate in it? And if I have something to say, I can just interject. Yeah, yeah. you can always interject. Yes. So, uh, it is best that you uh, pick uh, two to three words from each uh, session. Minimum of two. But you can go more. Yes, minimum of two. Uh, you can always expand to the infinite. And you will then. Wait, Lauren Britton has. Uh, okay, good. Already muted herself. Wonderful. Uh, so. We will send you the description of the assignment too. Yeah. Don't worry. We have a, we have a written description, but we just wanted to discuss it to make sure everyone understand what it is. And if any question comes up, it's good. And then it will get recorded for the video so yes. people can watch the first video to understand how this project will come together. So we are basically uh, creating a collaborative uh, encyclopedia of the termini that come up in the sessions and especially in the seminar. But that's not the final presentation. That encyclopedia, in a way, will feed into the final presentation, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. That is just your part of it. And they, you're not, but they, they will work with the programmers. It's just the yeah. beginning part of it. Yeah, that's that will be mostly done by uh, by the people in the seminar, including you and me, because we are gonna also like participate in it, right? Yes. And then we'll do something with it. Yes. But but the encyclopedia is, is one part and the image is the second part. Yeah. And those termini will be should be uh, defined by you in ways that are not completely uh, con congruent or coming out of the descriptions that have been offered by the professors. And that already exist in like yeah. in like encyclopedias or Dictionaries or online, right? So, so basically, you you you're interested in a couple of words for today's seminar. Hopefully, each one of you, right? These words are not words I created on spot. I'm borrowing these words from other people. These words already have definitions out there, right? But and, and of course, if you want to like work with these words, you probably have to go and read about it or ask questions what they mean. You already might know what they mean already. But the, but but here, the exercise is not to just copy paste their definition but actually redefine them, extend their definition, sometimes completely against their meaning, if you feel necessary, right? And basically get out of the border of what the identity or definition of that term is and try to reinvent it and mm -hmm. own it through your own definition, right? Yes. So blur, blur the line of what people already think this, this term means versus what you think they should think it means. And for each seminar, at least pick two words, if not more, to then work with and play with and extend their definition. And also find for each word at least one picture that we that you think is representative of your definition of- Or as word. many. Or as many, at least. One. At least one picture, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and remember the number of pictures just like just like the discussion we had about the star and constellation, really, really is about emphasizing a singularity to that one picture, or emphasizing a network or a constellation by going for more than one picture, right? So the more you, the more you, the more you, the more pictures you pick to associate with that term, it really it's about the emphasis you put on visuality. Because if you just put one image, that one image has to somehow at least pretend to embody a lot.
But if you put contradictory or a larger number of pictures, it kind of takes the emphasis away from image and make the images be sort of part of a network of what will make sense of that term, right? But of course, these relationships are not direct. Feel free to exercise poetry and myth making as you do this, right? Yeah, so it's not like about finding pictures. And of course, the work we, we prefer if you appropriate the work from the internet and not include your own drawings or paintings or image or photographs. But of course, that is fully permitted. But it would be better if we all just basically steal from the internet and add to it. And we will participate with you every week and we will do the same because that's how it's going to become like a collaborative art project, not me and Patrick telling you what to do, but to actually participate in doing it. And the, the, the sort of like the technology for doing it will be a spreadsheet, which we will create a Google spreadsheet that you will have access to. And each, each person will get a tab for where they post their link to the images and the terminology. The format is already done and it's very nice. It's very easy to use. And then closer to half of the seminar, we begin to discuss how we're going to use uh, algorithms and technology to manipulate these and connect them together. As these terms come together, as our images come together, we will have a better idea of like how we can collectively sort of like create an output or interface or exhibition for that, right? That's really like what I what we have in mind for this. If there's any other detail, maybe maybe bring it up. But I think that's the that's the basis of I it. I think right? that's, a, that, that, that's yeah. concise and basic. And we will send you a complete text of the whole modalities, how it works, and example. Yeah, the description of the of the assignment and also a quick note about presentation and and responses and a little bit of guide to how how we can get done will be all presented to you and please take these presentations very seriously the reason why i i, I emphasize that is that this is the practice part of what you're here to basically do with us right and this is something that other colleges and universities other institutions of, of of education do not offer we really want to work with you to practice your presentational skills, the way you appear on stage, the way you talk and put ideas into language. And it can only happen if you practice it here during these presentations and responses. So very important to take this aspect of the work seriously and really work with us to present, to, to produce really concise, to the point, well-presented arguments around these readings and material that the artists will provide and really exercise how the art of presenting and talking to public will work because you will need it in the future as an artist or as an academic person or as someone who wants to be engaged in the world of art and ideas. Very important. I totally like emphasize again, take these presentations seriously and try to do your best. And remember, if nobody else is watching, that the camera on Google is watching you and recording it and and making an impression. So I think now we should jump to the... Uh, Let's see if anyone has questions about this. Yeah. Sure. Any questions about the, the, the collaborative project or the presentations from those who are here? Anybody uh, who has already decided on the professors? Yeah, they're writing on the sidebar. Yeah, I mean, just some some have not yet. So, I mean, uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 minutes of the seminar, I'll uh, come back to the issue. Just keep that in mind to look at the, the link that Razon posted and think of two people to present and respond to. Otherwise, we will go now to the... Uh, what we missed from the earlier on, right? Yes. Let's see if anybody wants to have anything to say. Let's see who's here. We still got Ali Asghar, Kelly, Lauren, Miguel, Razwan, and William. William, do you want to like unmute yourself, please? You got the mic. Go ahead. Yep. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I don't know. What? Uh, 
Do you have any questions about the assignments and about the final collaborative project? When will we find out about the um, the technical approach? I think I will start engaging the programmer, invite him to sem to to the end of the seminars, starting with like the fourth or fifth session. So in in two or three weeks. Okay. What do you have programming skills? A little bit, yeah. That would be good. That would be okay. lovely. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Okay, Patrick, maybe you want to like. Then let's go to art uh, after the machines. Yes, you got the you got the mic. So we have. This is just to fulfill what we set out to do, right? Yes. Instead of instead of closing early, we have ten minutes, and if there's discussion after that, that would be good too. So I will slightly modify my presentation now because otherwise you will go completely over uh, over time. So Art of the Machines by Mohammed Saleh. Not really, and all those other names that are written under it. Of the, the, the text without author. Yes. With, with author. So with and without author. Yeah. So the te text. I hope everybody of you has read it. And I will now summarize it uh, according to what is important for this seminar. You can completely counter read my reading for other things. So this is not a universal reading, as any reading of any text is. So after Art of the Machines, uh, delves into the issue of how machinic intelligence uh, can also uh, see art and how art uh, seldom delves into this uh, uh, possibility and cuts itself out of the possibility to be read by machines. So to the, the non-human uh, other that this was created by humans. And so therefore I, I, I quote in the, from the beginning of the text, for art to make sense and to survive the uprooting effects of the escalating cybernetics revolution, it needs to be something other than what it has been. The place to consider the future of art is as much the world of thought as it is the artist's studios or the galleries. The text goes then in that art can be seen as an enabler for both the artist and the viewers. That it enables them to, to, to think new things. That, and then the text develops a very crucial and very important thing the, that art uh, can uh, bring forth new epistemic uh, production, no new epistemic machines, thought machines, so to say, that can enable us to revisit and re. Uh, uh, we live basically past uh, theories and past understandings of uh, phenomena and and the world. And it then offers uh, the text uh, one necessity that art in the future needs to be com become completely processoral and transmittable. But we have currently two modes of art, of seeing art, of saying this is art. It fits into uh, A or B. So A would be that everything humans, you, what, what humans create that want that, that, that brings forth beauty is a uh, is is art so that would be a and b would be uh, that 
the critique of past forms of producing art, let's say conceptual art, uh, is already art. It's it al already the, 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 the attack of former modes of production, quote unquote, deconstruction by creating difference is already art. It supersedes A. But the text, Art of the Machines, uh, says we have to go further. We have to create a C. And this is the, the in this text sees that the problem is that both A and B only come from human understanding, meaning that the under current understanding of art is not universal. It's completely immersed and it re-immerses itself into human, uh, human phenomenological uh, understanding. It's, 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 it is basically solipsistic. And we're not talking about the Anthropocene here. We're not talking about uh, animals seeing uh, uh, art. We're really talking about here that art has become like 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 a uh, like a snail that bites its tail so and it becomes ever more uh, biting its ever self indulgent yeah it's, it's self indulgent and people who have, have no understanding of of the history of art can't understand b and people who say uh, I don't think that art is just the pro pro production of beauty and beauty is relative also fall, fall out of that co whole conundrum. So we need the production of a new universalism. And then the text goes on to say uh, we have currently something that presents itself as universal. The art uh, artistic research but the, the the text then goes into the criticism of art artist research, artistic research saying that it is not really research it's not really research based because it goes away from what art actually was and is still sometimes able to do to produce uh something out of its own epistemic knowledge, epistemic understanding of the world. But the idea that we can use art to produce uh, research-based knowledge is, is nil. Because researchers uh, from social sciences, from mathematics, from all the different uh, rigorous studies will always be uh, will, will always will win out their research, their uh, publications, everything they will do will always create a larger amount, a more stronger pull of epistemic knowledge than what artistic research without that rigor can ever create. So the problem is not to instill that rigor into art and create art as like uh, social sciences. Yeah, social sciences, like a, like the the funny clowning way to do research. Uh, so then we put a funny artist on the panel next to three brain researchers. So which is very fashionable these days. Absolutely, I just went to Hakaway to have like one of these these interesting uh, circles. As part of the Transmediale Festival. Yeah, I'm not saying who it was, but still. <laughs> you know, Lauren lives in Berlin, right? We have actually a Berlin person in the, in the seminar. So I don't know how much of it she she saw as part of the Transmediale or not. So then I, I will quote again one part of the text. I'm, I'm really rushing through it. And uh, in number 20 of the text, it says there are unreliable and unsound extremes in both art and sciences, which effectively define a spectrum 
that begins with nonsense and ends in propaganda. Basically saying that if you put art to the full use of ideology, of an idea, it becomes the propaganda of that idea. It loses uh, the pertained, the pertained freedom that you ascribe to art and artistic production. And then it's, the text goes on to say the rigorous art of tomorrow must bridge the gap between the sciences and humanities, yet remain on the humanities sides of the divide. Saying that art is, is, is rooted in, in humanities. And in the last instance has to remain committed to, to the human, human side of the, 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 the human side of sciences or knowledge rather than the scientific side. So well, how I read the text, uh, because Muhammad and me, we have wrote something about ep the new epicenter. So like in, in, the, in the latest issue yeah. of the arts, arts of the working class, we have not made it available uh, online, but we are, we're trying to like put yeah. it together and, and put it on, on triple ampersand soon. So we call for a new centrality that is bound, uh, that, that, that is bound to ep Epis, uh, uh, epistemic knowledge, an art that really tries to produce new understanding of, of knowledge and not tries to let itself be used by ideas. So, and it's very. It's a long. Uh, it's a long. It's a long. Uh, and there's a long history in art that it is in the end used by by, by certain ideas, certain ideology, ideologies use 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 it, and then it becomes something else. It still is in the realm of of, of humanistic uh, art production because, but but it can becomes intermeshed like like you. Can integrate a virus into a system, and still the the, the, the organism stays the say stays an or, the organism, but there's something else, else at play. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I don't know, uh, it's been a long time since this text was written. Is that okay? If in the divide between sciences and humanities, art has to be on the side of hum, hu, humanities at, in the last instance. In the divide between form and content, I think art should remain committed to form. I really am one of those people who thinks who think at the end of the day, despite all the political, uh, scientific, social research and knowledge that we might or might not produce in our work as an artist, we really should be on the side of producing new forms in the last instance when it comes down to it. What we do also must involve, must involve production of new forms. If it doesn't, it really is undermined as, as art. If we're not committed as much as we are in the last instance to the human side of the divide in the sciences, to the form side of the divide in, 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 in this classic binary of form and content. And one of the most crucial ways how that text deals with it uh, is there is one sentence, and I think it's really, really amazing. I'm just going to read it. It says, we need art because it is only true art that we might be able to find a non-trivial cybernetic system for re-establishing a shared inhuman ethical foundation. And we already don't have an ethical foundation as humans. Let alone one for machines. So. What the text basically says that that we we are still like completely in our solipsistic modes of this is my foundation. Let's say my my Western uh, foundation. This is my foundation from another standpoint. But we have like these all these different standpoints that are in itself rooted in history. But clearly, because since they're all rooted in certain uh, personal and political histories, can never pertain to be universal for, for, for 
human and human, non-human. Human and, and non-human in the second instance. And uh, while that might sound even more complicated than creating unshared universal knowledge and understanding, actually looking at what and how uh, machines of the future, and we're not talking about one singular machine that will come out and then we will have like one singular entity of only Google, only YouTube, only iPhone. We're talking about the different uh, realities that are the, of potentials that could exist and how we could create a universal knowledge that can be shared, shared and we understand by the potentials of technical, the technological understanding of tomorrow. So that's basically my uh, take on the essay. take on that essay. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, any 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 questions or any uh, concerns about the about the about the reading because we're in the last leg of the leg of the seminar and that that's the moment to to open the discussion. I mean, we can go on at least for another uh, twenty minutes, but we don't have to. So go ahead, William. Um, I think that that last part. Um, Kind of answered my question, but like to bring it in a, in a speculative way, to, but to just like get clear on kind of like um like the current um whatever like uh, groups of conversations um the on page um where is this on page or or point eighteen. Uh, it says the skin through which art impacts its surrounding world is where its potential as a platform lies. Yeah, it's basically the, the, what I was saying that the form is very important, right? Because the form is what we what our senses perceive, and and perception takes place between your 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 sort of like your 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 senses and the surface of the art, right? It's somewhere there. Well, there I, I, right? you know, I I think I I mean I, I'm. I think I'm on the same page in that regard, but I'm wondering exactly how you're using the word platform and whether like how that would relate to like the um, accelerationist stuff and then the surrounding discourse around. Do you want to like maybe maybe reserve the term for further like that okay. would be a good term to kind of like play with. Okay. But okay, please read it again because I completely focus paying attention to the second part of the sentence rather than the first part. So, hello. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, your video disappeared, but it's totally fine. Go ahead, it's on again. Go ahead. Uh, what do you say? Read the second part. Yeah, where where I use the word platform. Just read that, so I can I can actually answer your question. So I read the uh, first half of eighteen. And so, as far as aesthetics are concerned, art nevertheless produces an objective knowledge of surface effects. The skin through which art impacts the surrounding world is where its potential as a platform lies. The reduction of art to this surface level is indeed necessary if we intend to teach and pass on the idea and practice of art to our machines. Consider, for example, the look and feel of fictional worlds and the aesthetics of social insights and interaction. Art can, in such contexts, facilitate access to knowledge for both humans and machines. Okay, so here, basically, I'm, I'm, the, the, the platform here is used not necessarily in its like physical, physical meaning, where we we identified with like with like uh, we identified with like services and companies and like even new center where like they're not based in physical location and don't have factories or buildings but they operate on sort of clouds and servers. Here, what I mean by platform actually is basically metaphorically like that, like art as a platform, which is like art not necessarily as like a physical art space or physical art object but art as a platform in the same sense that facebook or or new center or google is a platform right is potential to become a plat a, a virtual platform lies in its lies in its ability to first of all understand that the surface the surface which is like the very basic like superficial form not complex ideas that that are only available to humans or human cognition through language is basically where the potentials of it to make to make sense to machines lie because our mach our machines are entering the are entering the world of 
the world of cognition and knowledge so far only through these like artificial sensing systems that they have right like say like image recognition text recognition right speech recognition right color recognition these are like things that like um, are are coming coming up and getting added to like the abilities of machine to read read the world right the reading of a temperature you know what i mean reading of moisture and all sorts of like very rudimentary understanding of surfaces right so if you if you if we want to make if we want to make art that also appeals to non-human we should bring down the level to the level of surface you know what i mean so so in a sense in a sense like abstract art or or very like basic geometric art could be like a good example because machines are capable of understanding what a triangle is they might not understand you know what i mean the nuances of like for instance like understanding how class and gender interact in a in like in a subaltern context of like kerala in india it's still a little bit too deep for them right but they do understand and recognize the difference between a circle and a triangle from a square or they understand the difference between red and blue because its geometry is far more sim sim simpler than say geometry of a complex problem when you try to deal with like socio-political issues that are so entangled even our university systems and scholars and activists have not been able to deal with you know what i mean so 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 the potentials of art to make sense to machine lies in its sort of like surface so if you want to start somewhere that's where you start you know what i mean like almost like you know what i mean qr code very basic stuff right mm. any other questions Can I follow up? Yes. Um, I look. I'm. Uh, I've been looking at um, Luciana Parisi's uh, Contagious Architecture, um, and I think like I I, uh, I I personally am interested in in like surfaces, especially like the like the like topology conversations or whatever. But I'm wondering like how you would relate that 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 in, to the context of like Luciana's critique, which is which is that like um, and maybe I'm decontextualizing, but that like um, uh topological culture and like top like surface of I can't I can't do it justice but like surface of computation is like a, it's like a mode of control like topology and surface as as the dominant mode of control yeah I mean I mean absolutely L Luciana is an inspiration for us and I I agree with that critique but that just makes the surface the battleground in fact it's the battleground absolutely it's the battleground and and leaving it behind, it only almost like leaves the battleground to the enemy. So unfortunately, we have to engage at that level if you if you if you want to have any kind of impact deeper than the surface. That's where you begin because that's where the battleground is. In fact, this is where, like, yeah, totally, like what, what she calls algorithmic governmentality, right? That's where, like, that's where that's where it kind of like begins almost, right? So any other questions? Okay, so maybe maybe we have about 16 minutes left from the maximum three hours. Let's get the rest of the respondents and, and presenters, I think. It's fine. I mean, I mean, if people are not giving us the, the name of people they want to present and respond to, we will assign them. We will we will have to wait for a few days and then we will assign it basically. Yeah. That's what's gonna happen. So so we'll we'll wait a couple of days and we'll send reminders and emails tomorrow yeah, to right. get to get to to get this rolling. But we will definitely like have all the all the re, uh, presentations and responses in place. The the email will include the link to the spreadsheet where all the all the definitions and redefinitions will go. All of us will participate there. And the, the video and the sidebar notes will be posted to the Google Classroom related to the seminar. And you can watch the video or fast forward and do the parts you need to see there. And also we will post uh, the film that was given to us by Alejandro there for you to watch Alejandro's film 
in any discussion that comes out of that. And uh, basically, that's about it. If there's no more comments or questions, maybe we can close off the first session. But we're open to a last comment if anyone wants to like add something. One thing that we would do normally in seminars that we didn't do today due to, I don't know, excitement and the fact that uh, we had a guest was that go around so everybody gets to self-identify and tell us who they are and how would they like to be identified. B basically, the name, surname, nickname, um, gender, and all that. We didn't do that because I just basically got too deep into discussing like Greenberg and all that. And there was a there was a moment I thought about it and I thought, okay, after this we'll do it, but we never did it. But we will certainly do that first thing next seminar, which will be with Julieta, which is also interesting. We actually do a brief one of it in every seminar because I think it's important that our instructors that are coming in for one week get to know you. But the first one will be a little bit more comprehensive. So if you want to like prepare a little two line three line bio do that for the next week actually because then it will be it will be pro properly done I next week that, I think yeah actually it would be the best yeah if, the, if, do if, it next if week. everybody just writes their name once they come online and then they can write their pronoun too yeah because then yeah. then we, we all know how, how people up the preference of being being called what what pronoun they like to use and how they like to be called like my name is mohammed but i don't use mohammed i like to be called mo I don't, I don't, I don't like to become Mohammed or like other stuff. Like, also, like I think, I think Kid just changed his name, right, Kid? Yeah, because because when we began the process, it was something else, and then it became Kid. So yeah, so we so we will deal with that next week, right in the beginning of the seminar. Yes. Okay. And also, please remember always use your new center email address to log on to the classroom to to, the class, yes. to all the stuff because the spreadsheets will only work with that email. And yeah, you really have to uh, log off all your other accounts, log into the new center account, and then access documents or interact with them. Forms, all that needs to be all with the, with the new center email, so then it's done right. Thank you very much. So yeah, so see you all next week. See you. Same, Thanks, same place. Bye. Thank cool. you. See you. See you. Bye-bye.